Welcome everyone. I now call the June 6, 2023 regular City Council meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The City of Bothell is now providing the option of attending council meetings remotely or in person. Public comment will be allowed both in writing or verbally. Verbal comments may be taken either in person or remotely. Sign-up sheets were provided online by the City Clerk's Office via link from the agenda. A call-in phone number was provided on the meeting agenda for members of the public who wish to listen live to the meeting. If you have called in, we ask that you mute your device. If a participant fails to mute their connection and causes a disruption to the meeting, the connection will be terminated. At this point, we'll take a moment to take roll call of the council members by position number. Please say here when the city clerk calls your name. Council Member Zorns. Here. Mayor Thompson. Here. Council Member Aldirks. Council Member McNeil. Here. Council Member Absent. Um, Mankey, sorry. Councilmember Dodd? Here. Deputy Mayor Alcabra? Here. All present with the exception of Councilmembers Alderks and Councilmember Mankey, who um, told me he will be late getting here. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk. Next, I'd like to reiterate some meeting guidelines. For remote meeting attendees, please speak clearly and pause frequently. Mute your microphone when not speaking. And for council attending remotely, use the raised hand feature when you wish to speak. And if the rest of council wants to point at her, if I don't notice it, I'd appreciate that too. All right, first agenda item is meeting agenda approval. Um, we have moved visitor comment up on the agenda immediately following proclamations. Are there any other changes to tonight's agenda? Seeing none, um, we'll move on to uh, public engagement opportunities. Mark your calendars for this year's summer events. You can join the City of Bothell this summer for the 4th of July Parade and Pancake Breakfast, Summer Nights in Bothell, and more. The Pop-Up Dog Park is returning. Um, the Pop-Up Off-Leash Dog Parks return to the park at Bothell Landing, open now through mid-September. And the Bothell Police Community Blood Drive is Thursday, July 6th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. You can give the gift of blood and schedule your July 6th appointment today. All right, we have a couple proclamations. Um, the first one is for Pride Month. Whereas the city of Bothell recognizes the month of June 2023 as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual, LGBTQIA plus Pride Month, and observes Pride Month with a progress pro pride flag raising ceremony to honor the history of the LGBTQIA plus liberation movement and to support every person's right to experience equality and freedom from discrimination. And whereas the Progress Pride flag is widely recognized as a symbol of pride, inclusion, and support for social movements that advocate for LGBTQIA plus people in society, and the City of Bothell is committed to supporting visibility, dignity, and equality for LGBTQIA plus people in our diverse community and their immeasurable impact on cultural, civic, and economic successes, and whereas the LGBTQIA plus community continues to be a target of violence, harassment, and discrimination, and yet continue to thrive through the efforts of the community itself and through the support of LGBTQIA plus affirming spaces, agencies, and individual allies. And whereas, while society at large increasingly supports LGBTQIA plus equality, it is essential to acknowledge that the need for education and awareness remains vital to end discrimination and prejudice. And whereas celebrating Pride Month influences awareness and provides support and advocacy for the LGBTQIA plus community and is an opportunity to act and engage in dialogue to strengthen alliances, build acceptance, and advance equal rights. Now, therefore, I, Mason Thompson, Mayor of the City of Bothell, do hereby proclaim this month of June 2023 as Pride Month in support of the LGBTQIA plus community. Be it resolved that the Progress Pride flag was raised on May 31st at City Hall to recognize all LGBTQIA plus residents whose influential and lasting contributions to our neighborhoods make the city of Bothell a vibrant community in which to live, work, and visit. And I believe we have Kat Antes Tadros and Cynthia Geiger here to accept. Acceptance and Kat, same thing. Um, and I just turn it on for you. Um, I'm Cynthia Geiger. I'm f I represent 
Key Flag, Bellevue East Side. Oddly enough, Bothell is counted as East Side instead of North End. <laughs> um, P Flag envisions a world where diversity is celebrated and all people are respected and valued and affirmed. We in the LGBTQIA plus community hope for acceptance, inclusion, and equality so that we can all live our best lives in safety and goodwill. And we appreciate knowing that our larger community accepts these goals and supports our efforts, and we thank you very much. Kat, would you like to say a few words? Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, thank you to the council for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I would like to accept this proclamation for myself and Cynthia um, because we deserve it and we love ourselves. Okay, goodbye. Yay. Exactly. Um, okay, anyway. Um, no, but I would like to accept this proclamation on behalf of Eastside Pride, um, which is an organization that strives to educate, connect, and strengthen the LGBTQ Eastside community. They are working hard to really foster um, the community on this side of the lake for both youth and adults, which is really great. Um, so as most of you know, I think most of you have seen me before. Um, I work with kids, so I wanted to share some statistics from the Trevor Project, um, which provides LGBTQ crisis support services and does some great advocacy work. Um, so 50% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide in the last year, including higher rates overall for youth of color. Um, and then between 48 to 59 percent of trans and non-binary people, including both youth and adults, have seriously considered suicide in the last year. Um, and then 93 percent of transgender and non-binary youth said that they have worried about transgender people being denied access uh, to gender-affirming medical care due to state or local laws. So something that's interesting um, is that some of our LGBTQ youth are really plugged into what's happening around them right now uh, regarding legislation uh, because it's directly affecting them. They are becoming interested in social justice issues, which is great. However, some of them are doing it out of necessity for their own safety, which is terrifying for adults to experience, let alone a child. Uh, and I can guarantee you that there are probably youth that will walk around downtown with their family and feel a sense of relief, uh, feel like they're being seen, and feel like things can and will get better. And maybe they're having these thoughts of suicide, and maybe they're terrified of medical care laws coming to Washington or our area. Uh, and maybe they have a family who is not supportive of the community, so they're afraid to come out. But by seeing the flag that's outside, um, by seeing all of the flags around town that I've seen, uh, by seeing all of the celebrations of their community, they can see that they will not feel this way forever. That one day they can experience queer joy with their authentic selves, and that there are people who can and will support them along the way. And while there's so much work to do, this official proclamation, the flag raising, and the public support of the LGBTQ community is a step in the direction, in the right direction, for all of our youth in Bothell and for all of our adults too, uh, to help make things a bit brighter and a bit more colorful. So just in case, um, Trevor Project uh, has really great crisis lines if anyone ever needs them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have a proclamation for Orca Action Month. Whereas the southern resident orcas were listed as endangered in November 2005 under the Endangered Species Act, and whereas the major factors in the decline of the southern resident orca population include declining salmon runs, toxic pollution, loss of habitat, and increasing vessel traffic noise levels in the Puget Sound and the ocean, and whereas during the month of June, the Orca Network, the Orca Salmon Alliance, and other organizations working on these issues will join together in a month-long focused effort to educate the public and take action to improve conditions for the survival of the southern resident orcas. And whereas bringing attention to the orcas will also bring attention to the need to clean up Puget Sound watersheds and to restore and conserve important habitats for Chinook salmon, including the Salmon River and local Bothell streams. And whereas the City Council's 2040 vision includes environmental stewardship, highlighting verdant habitats, cool streams, thriving salmon, and our community's mental and physical health because we value and protect our abundant ecological resources. Now therefore I, Mason Thompson, Mayor of the City of Bothell, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2023 as Orca Action Month and call upon all residents to focus to attention on the plight of the fragile southern resident community of orcas and take action restoring rivers and streams which support salmon as a critical food source for whales and clean water for us all. And um, I believe we have Megan Costand here to accept on behalf of Whale Scout.
Hi everyone, my name is Megan Kosand and I use she, her pronouns. I'm here with Whale Scout, which is a local nonprofit that works to educate people about whales and restore salmon habitat in the community so that we can feed our endangered southern resident killer whales. I'd like to take a bit of time to thank Bothell City Council, staff, and everyone else who's involved for their efforts to recover and steward our endangered species and the ecosystems that we all live in. You've spent time and effort taking care of stormwater runoff management and increasing urban tree cover. Some of you have actually come out and joined us in removing invasive blackberries and planting native trees to help restore salmon habitat. Here at Whale Scout, we're looking forward to spending the rest of Orca Action Month celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act with a number of events and volunteer opportunities. Some of those are actually coming up this weekend. On Saturday the 10th, we have an opportunity to help restore a salmon habitat at the former Wayne Golf Course, which is now a Bothell City Park. And then on Sunday the 11th, we have a kayak tour on the Sammamish River. We also have a number of volunteer opportunities to water our plantings from the fall throughout the summer. And if you're interested in information on any of these events and more, then you can go to our website at whalescout.org or find more regional events at orcamonth.com. And once again, thank you very much for your support. And Megan, thank you so much and everybody at Whale Scout for everything you do here in Bothell as well. We appreciate you. All right, moving on, next up is visitor comment. The city has accepted visitor comment and writing as well as accepted sign-up sheets for those who wish to speak at tonight's meeting. Written comments submitted to the city clerk no later than 3 p.m. today were forwarded to do all city council members and are part of the record. When the clerk calls your name, you will have three minutes to speak. Please note that council will receive your input, but on the advice of our city attorney, we do not engage in discussion of these topics. Staff will make note of items requiring follow-ups. City clerk, do we have anybody signed up? Thank you, Mayor Thompson, we do. But before we begin, I would like to remind commenters that while you may speak to whatever topic you choose, we ask that if you are a council candidate, you do not use this time to speak to your own campaign. Each person is solely responsible for their own comments, but speaking about your own campaign could be a violation of campaign laws, which the Public Disclosure Commission would determine. And with that, uh, I'll begin with the written comment received. Uh, first was Andrew Nelson, who wrote regarding the pride appreciation. Mark Swanson wrote in regarding opposition to middle housing zoning changes. And Pat Pierce wrote regarding opposition to creating a regional fire district. We have one person signed up this evening to speak, um, and that is Mark Swanson. So Mr. Swanson, if you'd like to go to the podium, you'll have three minutes. I'd like to remind uh, council and staff of something I've mentioned before, that the original name of Redmond used to be Salmonburg because the number of kokanee that were there. You could imagine walking across the Sammamish River on their backs. There were so many. <clears throat> it took me a long time to get through college, 10 years. Three and a half of those years I had to quit, go to work, go back, quit, Go to work, go back. When I worked, I worked all kinds of things. As a lobby houseman at the Red Line Inn across from SeaTac Airport. As a scully dishwasher, I worked for an aging contractor when he needed help, like carrying three tab up ladders to the top of the cabin, you know, digging a trench underneath the foundation in muddy water. Uh, worked uh, uncertain schedules, part-time jobs. Let me tell you, this idea that low-income people can use Metro, that's not the way it works. The way it works is they buy a cheap car, especially single mothers, so they can get from part-time job to part-time job, get to the daycare, go back, get the kids out of school. Metro works for people that are professionals who go from point A to point B not low-income people. This metro solution ain't going to work for a number of reasons, of which brings up the fact that in those three and a half years, I 
lived on top ramen, ragu, fried eggs, and Rainier beer. I don't think I'm the same. <clears throat> Metro buses are killing coho salmon. I sent to the council the science behind it. The bottom line is, for every passenger mile, a Metro bus pollutes six times more than a family car with tire dust. And while we know that the tire dust is an extremely toxic thing, what I haven't mentioned before is that snowfall and acid rainfall absorbs ozone and it continues to release the 6PD, 6PPD quinone out of the tire dust. If it's in the catch basin, if anywhere it is, if it's in the watershed, <clears throat> the bottom line is Metro buses are killing orcas, truly. <clears throat> I don't want to do your job. I really don't. I'm forced to do what I'm doing. I hope you can respect that in the future. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Uh, that's all I have signed up to speak. However, if there's anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak, please raise your hand or go to the podium. If you're virtual, please raise your hand and we'll give you a couple minutes. I'm not seeing anybody, Mayor Thompson. Thank you, Laura. Moving on, we have a special presentation, our post-legislative session update. Um, and we have uh, lobbyist Shelley Helder, Gordon Thomas Honeywell, here to present to us. Should I kick that over to you, City Manager? Uh, I'll just say a few words as Shelley gets, <laughs> gets settled. But um, no, we are thankful to have Shelley here. And thank you also to the Council for being willing to play with the order of the agenda tonight. I think um, there was a long session as we discussed through the session and there was a lot of details. So we wanted to make sure to give Shelley ample time and not also hold up public comment until after she was done. So appreciate the swap. And with that, Shelley, we're so grateful that you're here uh, this evening and spending time with us here in Bothell and also for all the work that you did with us uh, for us during the session and take it away. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good to be with you this evening. Um, I am going to share my screen so you can all see my presentation. Um, as was mentioned, I have the privilege of serving as the state government affairs consultant for the city of Bothell. And I don't remember what number year this is, but it's been several years and I'm continuing to enjoy it. So appreciate being with you all tonight. Before I get started on the presentation, I just want to note that in your council packet, there's um, a comprehensive written report that outlines in much more detail um, the state budgets, um, all the outcomes of the city's legislative priorities, and the bills that passed this session that have a nexus with items in the city's policy manual. Um, it goes into much more detail than I'll be able to cover this evening, so please use that as, um, as a resource for yourself. So the 2023 legislative session was the first time the legislature has conducted their work in person in two years. Uh, the public was still able to uh, participate virtually through remote testimony, um, but every legislator was in Olympia. Uh, it was the first year of the biennium, so it was a long 105 consecutive days, and the primary objective of the session was to adopt the biennial budgets, um, which the legislature did. And in addition to adopting the budgets, they also considered over 2,100 bills and ultimately passed 485. Because this was the first year of the biennium, any bill that did not pass this year is automatically reintroduced next year. Democrats held strong majorities in both chambers, and so they set the agenda in terms of which policies were considered and prioritized. And then following the last election cycle, there were over 20 new legislators. Um, and so there were new committee chairs, new committee members, new individuals in uh, positions of leadership in the caucuses, and all of that impacted what happened this session. So I mentioned the primary objective of the long session is to adopt biennial budgets. The state has three budgets. The operating budget funds all state agency operations, um, the largest of which is the K through 12 education system. 
The 23-25 state operating budget is $69.8 billion. Some noteworthy allocations are $20 million for grants to local governments to help update your comprehensive plans and development regulations. $150 million to transition individuals living in encampments to housing and over $250 million for various behavioral health services. The capital budget funds public and nonprofit construction projects and all of them are non-transportation related. It's a $9 billion budget primarily funded through the sale of bonds. Um, there's $95 million in remaining capacity for a supplemental budget next year. So obviously that's a pretty small amount of remaining capacity relative to the size of the budget this year. The capital budget makes major investments in housing, behavioral health, and education, just to name a few. The third and final budget is transportation, and it's a $13.5 billion budget. It's the first year of implementation of the Move Ahead Washington package. The revenues that fund the transportation budget, which are primarily the gas tax, are continuing to decline. Um, so heading into this session, there was a lot of concern because the governor's proposed budget pushed out the timeline for many key projects around the state. Um, for the most part, the legislature was able to honor previous commitments it had made on those transportation projects um, and provided a plan for phasing of funds over the next six years so that there's predictability for planning purposes. This was also the first year that budgets incorporated the Climate Commitment Act revenues. Um, that money is scattered throughout all three budgets, but is limited to um, carbon reducing programs and projects. So moving on to discuss the outcomes <clears throat> of the city's top priorities, the city identified five priorities for the 2023 session. The first was support for the stand-up of the Crisis Receiving Center in North King County. And this was a priority shared by um, our neighboring cities of Kirkland, Shoreline, Kenmore, and Lake Forest Park. And this project has been years in the making. Um, when you all were considering adoption of your legislative agenda, we weren't sure if there was gonna be sufficient funding for this project. And so leading up to and throughout the legislative session, I participated in routine coordinating meetings with the lobbyists for uh, Connections Health Solutions, as well as the lobbyists for the other cities. Um, and we wanted to ensure that our partnership was speaking with one voice. Ultimately, the facility was fully funded through uh, grant programs, primarily state grant programs, um, and we didn't have to pursue a direct appropriation um, from the legislature. We did, however, support the passage of Senate Bill 5120, which creates a licensing pathway for 23-hour crisis facilities. Um, the, really, the credit for the success of this priority is owed to city staff here in Bothell, as well as um, city staff and participating cities who um, really shepherded this project from vision to pending reality. The second priority was a request for the state to adopt policies and to make investments to increase the number and types of housing. There was a Department of Commerce report released last year stating Washington needs roughly a million new homes by 2044 to accommodate our projected population growth. And that of those homes, 525,000 need to be affordable at or below 50% of the area median income. This information prompted the legislature to pass policies aimed at bringing more homes to market and reducing the cost of construction. There were two separate bills passed to help reform the liability for condominium construction. Uh, there were resources provided to local governments to streamline permit processing. Um, there'll be a new SEPA exemption for infill housing that's consistent with the city's comprehensive plan. Perhaps the most discussed and longest coming policy that passed this session was on middle housing. Um, the momentum for this bill has been building for years and the legislature, as I mentioned, was motivated to reduce construction costs. And since one of the major cost drivers of new homes is the price of land, allowing more units to be built on the same amount of land was appealing to lawmakers. There were easily 10 dozen different versions of this bill over the years, so it can be difficult to keep track of what was included in the final version. Um, I'll just start off by saying what this bill doesn't do. 
It does not allow for sky rise development in single family neighborhoods. It does not prohibit the construction of single family homes. It does establish a minimum number of units that must be authorized on all lots zoned primarily residential. In Bothell, the city must allow at least two units on all lots and four units on lots that are in a quarter mile walking distance of a major transit stop. An accessory dwelling unit is considered one unit, which means if a city already allows ADUs on all lots, then they already comply with that component of the bill. Um, I also want to note that this does not mean that two units must be built on a lot. It still leaves that discretion up to the property owner. The version of the bill that passed the legislature was a compromise, both on the part of housing advocates who wanted to see um, greater density authorized on all lots and on, um, on the part of local governments who didn't want to see their land use and zoning decisions preempted. Um, the version of the bill that passed was, like I just said, a compromise. The third priority um, that we focused on this session was requesting the phasing for the $7 million that was allocated to the Bothell Way multimodal project. Um, and that was in the Move Ahead Washington package, which is a 16-year package, meaning some of the projects that were awarded funding through Move Ahead um, are inevitably going to have to be on the latter end of that 16-year horizon. So we advocated that our funding would be allocated soon over the next two biennia to be specific. Um, and that's to align with the project timeline. So the final budget um, doesn't include the specific split that we requested, but the full 7 million is allocated over the next four years, um, which is a major success. Um, many projects have been slated for funding in the future, which is beyond the next six years um, with no definitive timeline. So th this outcome really is the result of the leadership and the persistence of our first district legislators who um, took it upon themselves to make sure that our funding was awarded in a time that we can use it. The fourth priority was requesting a reappropriation of the $250,000 that the legislature previously awarded the city for the development of a transportation demand management program at Canyon Park. This funding was awarded in the supplemental budget year and wasn't able to be fully spent before the end of the state's fiscal year. So we requested that the funding be reappropriated so that uh, we could use it for its intent. The original warning and our request for reappropriation um, was uncertain because it came from the state's operating budget, which has historically been very strict about not using any of its resources for transportation purposes. So. Um, the fact that the funding was reappropriated this year in the new biennial operating budget is again to the credit of our first district legislators who championed the request. In addition, the transportation budget also includes a $333,000 grant this biennium and a $267,000 grant for next biennium for the transportation demand management program. And that's through the regional mobility grant program. That's a competitive grant program that's administered by WashDOT funded in the state's transportation budget. And that's a direct result of city staff putting together a competitive application and ensuring that you take advantage of that, that grant funding. Finally, the fifth priority was a continuation of something the city has maintained as, a, as an important topic for many years. We asked the legislature to continue investing in the remedial action grant program um, to continue with the revitalization efforts um, downtown. Um, we asked both for staffing and additional grant funding, um, which the legislature did. They funded the program at 115 million, which is an, an increase of roughly 44 million over the previous biennial budget. So in addition to the city's top priorities, there were dozens of other policies that advanced that impact city government. Um, the city has a policy manual which outlines your position on many of these issues. And I'm just gonna briefly review outcomes from three categories. The first is environment. Um, there were two rather substantial policies that passed the legislature this session, and both happened to be sponsored by members of Bothell's delegation. 
The first was passage of House Bill 1181, sponsored by Representative Davina Dewar, which adds the goal of climate change and resiliency to the list of elements required in comp plans. Um, Representative Dewar worked tirelessly on this legislation, uh, which not only passed this year, but also received over $40 million in funding for implementation in the operating budget. The second is Senate Bill 5144, sponsored by Senator Derek Stanford, and it creates a battery, battery stewardship program overseen by the Department of Ecology, um, but developed and funded by battery producers. Um, the bill allows the essentially battery manufacturers that operate in Washington um, the time to get the program up and running. So you won't necessarily see it tomorrow, but eventually there will be locations throughout the community to uh, recycle batteries. The second category is public safety. And um, the first item in this category is the reason that the legislature was called um, back to Olympia for a special session. So the state's Previous law on possession of controlled substances was set to expire June 30th of this year. That law was intentionally established as a temporary solution following the Supreme Court's ruling in early 2021 that drug possession was not a felony. Senate Bill 5536 initially passed the Senate with bipartisan, su bipartisan support and established possession as a gross misdemeanor. And it outlined the procedure for pretrial diversion and a pathway for a vacation of conviction. The House amended the bill substantially, um, and they established possession as a misdemeanor and also included use uh, in public places, among many of the other changes that they made. Because the bill passed uh, each chamber in different versions, it didn't pass the legislature, and a committee was formed to try to find uh, agreement. Um, a final version of the bill was brought forward on the last day of session, and ultimately it failed to receive sufficient votes. So the legislature adjourned the regular session with no fix to current law, or then current law. Uh, the governor called for a special session to begin on May 16th, uh, which is when legislators returned to Olympia, and they debated a compromise bill that had been negotiated by all four caucuses. The compromise bill establishes knowing possession as a gross misdemeanor, and public use as a gross misdemeanor. Both are subject to a maximum of 180 days in jail and a $1,000 fine for the first two offenses. If there is a third offense, the maximum number of days in jail is raised to 364. And that's the standard limit for um, gross misdemeanors. After many impassioned floor speeches, uh, making arguments for and against the merits of the legislation, it passed the legislature um, with bipartisan support and was signed by the governor on the same day. The second topic um, on, pu on public safety is funding for co-responder programs. The operating budget allocates $4 million via the healthcare authority for grants to existing or new crisis response teams. So that's like the racer program that the city participates in. Um, and that funding is to help those programs meet the state standards and criteria in order to receive an endorsement to participate in the 988 system. Um, an additional $4 million is allocated to the Association of Washington Cities to assist cities with the cost of implementing alternative response teams. The third and final category is infrastructure. Um, there was a bill introduced by Senator Mark Mullet that would have created a public works revolving trust account within the state treasury, which would have protected that um, those funds from being used by state budget writers to balance other areas of the state's budget. If the bill had passed, it would have required um, approval of the voters since it amends the Constitution. It, it did not pass the legislature. But um, the legislature did allocate $400 million to the Public Works Assistance Account. And, um, and that, of course, provides financing for infrastructure projects for local governments. Additionally, the historical diversions, repayments from the account, or re repayments of loans that should be going back into the account had historically been diverted. They are now going to go back into the account, um, meaning that there's going to be more, more money available moving forward. And then finally, the capital budget invests $50 million in the Broadband Access Equity and Deployment Program. Um, that expands broadband access to unserved and underserved communities throughout the state. 
Um, this state investment of 50 million leverages a federal investment of 150 million. So now that the legislative session is over, what comes next? Well, I think many of you have heard me say before that advocacy and lobbying is a, a year round job. And to be successful during the legislative session, it's important that we continue our work over the interim months. Um, so to start, I would encourage the city to uh, consider ways of thanking your legislators, um, not just for advocating for the city's priorities, um, which they did, um, but for their dedication of time and energy to public service. You all know um, what, that, what that requires of you, and um, it, I know, will um, go a long way in hearing from fellow electeds how much their service is appreciated. Um, with all of the bills the legislature passed um, and the funding that was made available, there is a lot of work to do. And city staff um, already have their plates full. We'll have even more to do in the coming months to ensure that the funding that was allocated to the city is used in the allotted timeframes um, and that those projects are delivered. Lastly, it's never too soon to begin thinking about what our priorities should be for the 2024 session. Um, the Association of Washington City's Legislative Priorities Committee, which Councilmember Alderks serves on, um, has already had their first meeting to update the association's priorities for the 2024 session. Um, they'll be finalizing their process in October. 2024 will be a supplemental budget year, so there won't be a lot of new funding available, and it'll be a short session, um, so it's typically not the year to introduce any um, very difficult uh, pieces, to, pieces of legislation. Um, but it's good for us to consider what those priorities should be now. So I'll be working with you all and with city staff um, to update and develop draft documents that will be shared with you um, to ensure that we're ready for uh, day one of the 2024 session, which starts on January 8th. And with that, I will answer any questions. Councilmember Sorens. Well, Shelley, um, thank you. We're all big fans of you and Gordon Honeywell Thomas, and we're big fans of our staff that works in tandem with you. So get the thank you up there. Um, I do have a couple questions. Well, I have several questions. And it's related to what we we're talking about, but it's a little bit of a spin off thinking forward. Uh, there was a House Bill 1695 that allows uh, local governments to dispose surplus public property for public benefit. Do you know if DNR was part included in that? Not that I'm thinking of any specific DNR properties. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you would be thinking about. Um, I don't know, but I'd be happy to look into that. And if not, uh, if they weren't included to see if there's a way um, in the future to have them be. That would be fantastic because one property that I'm unofficially thinking about would be perfect for affordable housing. Um, and that I think council has talked about that before. Uh, next question is, um, we're making great strides in short term uh, help for people in crisis. Have you heard any buzz in, I was just listening to a gal who was talking about her fentanyl addiction and the need to have long-term therapies that go beyond 28 days to, to get like six months. Have you heard any conversation in Olympia about at some point providing more of those uh, services for folks who need long-term uh, care? Yes, yeah, I think you're, Correct that there's um, every everyone's story is different and everyone's recovery story and recovery journey is going to be different and so the services they need need to be tailored to their needs at the time, and I think that's exactly what the the legislature is trying to accomplish. Um, it's a complex puzzle to put together, mm -hmm. and so yes, there's awareness of that. Yes, there's a desire to meet that need. Uh, the specifics of what that looks like, I. I don't know off the top of my head. Well, and the reality is we have to take take it in bite-sized pieces. We can't just fix it all in one fell swoop, as wonderful as that would be. Uh, and then the other question, talking about battery disposals, has there been any discussion on Olympia, level, uh, on Olympia about uh, ethically sourcing lithium? Because we're trying to work towards a lot of electric vehicles 
and all of our lithium comes from places that none of us would want to work and get, you know, get lithium from. Has there been any discussion on a state level about ethically sourced lithium that you're aware of? That's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of a discussion at the state level, um, but I, I know that that topic is starting to bubble up more, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that okay. we see. Okay. Well, I, yeah. I love the opt optimism there. Yeah. And then maybe this is more of a question for our, our chief, but I saw the thing on pursuits and what was being, the things that were being added to do pursuits. Can, um, if it's something that it's a case where we suspect trafficking or kidnapping, that we can pursue? Is, is that something that existed before um, us going in and, and uh, amending police pursuits? Or, or is that even included in, is it included on any level? Uh, the most, I'm, I'm assuming you're directing this to me, the most recent one that I've seen, it's, it's acts of violence. So, Just acts of violence? Yeah. Would that be considered an act of violence? The kidnapping would be. Okay. But trafficking, probably not. Well, a trafficking, human trafficking, right? I believe, in essence, is falls under that statute. For that. Okay. All right. That's what I wanted to see. How big but, that umbrella uh, I, I was. Can, uh, let my uh, city attorney though chime in if he has any additional info. I don't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, that's that's my um, my full round of questions. I guess we need to start putting our thinking caps on. So thank you. Not everybody all at once. Oh, Councilmember Dodd. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shelley, for the update. Uh, Councilmember Dodd has actually covered my question. So I love when you go first and just have me covered. Um, but I did want to say thank you so much for your work and thank you for calling out staff work and our legislative delegation, too. It was really impressive to see everybody come together on these topics and see so much success for what we were looking for. So thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, I also want to third that. Thank you. Thank you, staff. But <clears throat> thank you especially because when you see the summary slide with all the money coming in, we are seeing the worth, the ROI of having somebody work on our behalf uh, in, in Olympia. So thank you. Appreciate it. Council Member McNeil. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yes, I'd like to echo that as well. Um, We've been working together for quite some time, and it's amazing to see the amount of work you can do and the dollars that you bring back to our community. Um, and the thanking of our staff for all their hard work and dedication to make that happen as well. It's very much appreciated. Um, I had a couple questions around outcomes. So it seems like an amazing body of work was done this year. Um, how do we, move moving forward, how do we measure outcomes of the success or failures of the things that we're doing today? In terms of the city's legislative priorities? Yes, like as an example, when we talk about housing or um, social mental services, how, how do we measure those outcomes, the investments that we're making into those to ensure that those dollars have outcomes that we wanna, we wanna see? That's an excellent question. Um, I guess I would in some ways turn it back to you all to decide what those, what those outcomes should be. You know, you've dedicated significant resources into this North King County Crisis Receiving Center. Um, and I think the outcomes would be that you have a facility available for law enforcement to take someone who's in a mental health crisis, something that's somewhere that's not the ER and somewhere that's not the jail. I think that's an outcome. That's a, a tangible deliverable that you all are working towards. Um, in terms of, I, I mean, I guess I'm trying to think of other, other outcomes that could be a result of, um, the priorities that you've identified. I think a really cool outcome for the Canyon Park TDM would be that there's less less traffic, less congestion in the Canyon Park area in, in the years to come. So I don't know, I guess I, slightly a reversal. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you, you said that. So it's something that council should be thinking about when we set the policies that we set and we move forward with our agendas. What are the outcomes that we're looking for? So when we invest the dollars of the community and we bring the dollars back into our community, what are those outcomes and what do they look like? So as an example, when you talk about who we're helping and how we're helping them, what does that look like? What do we want it to look like? Do we want it to be one person, 10 people, 100 people? Um, and at what level? 
right? So the, what level of service do we want to provide to our community? So often when I'm out talking to folks, they often ask, you invest all these millions of dollars into these programs, what are you, who are you trying to help? Why are you trying to help them? What is the problem you're trying to solve? And so to me, I wanted to ask you that question because it, again, it's an amazing body of work. But again, if we're just putting money into stuff without figuring out what those outcomes are, how do we judge whether or not it's successful or not, right? Um, it's easy to say that we're helping one, two, or three people, but are we really looking forward to the future and helping those and not reciprocating the same thing over and over and over again? Um, and the big thing that comes to mind when I, when I bring that topic up is we talk about affordable housing. We've been talking about affordable housing for a long, long time. And affordable housing isn't a moving target. And um, I heard, I've heard people use the, the words that um, we're not growing land, we are uh, allowing people to do more with their land, um, but until we can find ways to ensure that um, housing is not only going to be market rate, but it is, is designated as affordable, um, we're not really going to make a dent in affordable housing. And I, and I speak from ex experience because I've been doing construction for 30 years. And as an example, in any given city, it can cost as much as 60 to $100,000 to obtain a building permit. And that starting point is not affordable for most housing, as we know. So we, until we can find ways to make larger strides versus saying, if you're gonna build two houses on a lot, it's $200,000 for permits to build two houses, um, they're still not going to be affordable to, to most. So I think that we're moving in the right direction by having the conversation, but I'm hoping we can find the outcomes and have the discussions on the outcomes that we're looking for, because setting that target of affordable housing, and I remember when I was a kid and I tried to get into my first house, I was living in an apartment with two other guys. And that's just how it was, because I was at an age and I didn't make that kind of money. So I want to make sure that when we, when we make these policies and we make these changes in our land use and, and do the things that we're doing, that we're not just thinking about today, we're thinking about tomorrow, 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. Because when we talk about a million new people coming here, if the price of land continues to go up, it's not going to be that much more affordable. It's going to continue the same trend that we've been trending for 40 to 50 years. So um, I, I want to thank you again for all your hard work, dedication. It means a lot. I, I've enjoyed working with you. I want to continue working with you. And, and I think that you bring a lot to our community. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. I'm going to agree with my council members. Thank you. We really appreciate working with you. You've done a great job for us, and we, we know our staff likes working with you all as well. So thank you for coming up here. It's nice to have you in council chambers again as opposed to just Zoom. Um, and I hope your drive back is safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up we have the city manager report. City manager. Thank you very much, Mayor. I have, uh, I have two updates and then an introduction for you tonight. So first up, um, I want to encourage everybody watching and including our council as well to make sure that you stop by the mailbox. Uh, if you didn't yesterday, make sure you stop by tonight. Um, the city put out a mailer, a condensed version of the Bothell Bridge as we continue to, to test and try new ways of communicating with the community. Um, as many of you know, the Bothell Bridge went from being a uh, published mailer uh, regularly here throughout the community in Bothell to being an online production during COVID and um, staff's trying new ways of making sure that we reach multiple uh, audiences. So 22,000 of these mailers, just a front and back, went out. It directs uh, readers to where to find more information online. And in that, they'll get highlights around summer events that are taking place in Bothell. A uh, fireworks reminder, reminder of uh, that fireworks are in fact banned within city limits on the 4th of July um, with a few novelty exceptions. And then um, also more information on the comprehensive plan, making sure that that uh, process is in front of as many people as possible with an audience and then how to be following along. So again, thank you to our co communications team for all their work and willingness to try new things. and. Um, we'll wait and see feedback, and we're planning on another one in about six months, but we'll see what we learn from, from this mailing. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention um, as well is that tonight we uh, acknowledged Pride Month, and there was a, uh, it may come up in council conversations, but there was a flag raising, of course, last week. We've uh, discussed that and received some emails um, thanking 
um, thanking the city for doing that. And we heard tonight, too, the difference that the flag makes. Uh, well, we have another one coming up, too, next week. So I just wanted to alert the community, and we'll be getting more information out online. You'll probably see this on the engagement slide next week as well. But on next Thursday, June 15th at 4 p.m., there will be a flag raising for Juneteenth, uh, which is on June 19th. The flag will then be flown from that time at 4 o'clock on the uh, 15th through June 20th. We'll transition back to the pride flag, but really want to make sure we highlight that. And again, we, as we heard testimonial of the power of, of having a flag and um, having everyone feel welcome, uh, we want to uh, capture that next opportunity as well. So lastly tonight, then I do have an introduction, and we are just thrilled to have a new teammate here in Bothell. As council will remember, we added three new positions in the budget so uh, last year, and one of them was to um, add a resource to be serve as our diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator. Went out and did a national search, and from the, uh, from Vermont, we found somebody who was looking to to um, relocate to the Pacific Northwest, and we're to locate to the Pacific Northwest, and it's new new for them. But we're really grateful. So I'd like to introduce Gabby uh, Kuna to the Bothell team. Gabby, uh, as I mentioned, just completed her master's degree in education from the University of Vermont, uh, where they study DEI within systems of higher education. That will translate uh, well also to, to our organization, our community. They also previously earned their bachelor's degree in psychology from Cal State University Fullerton. Um, so really a wealth of experience. And again, Gabby will be instrumental in working with our staff and with our community to be focusing on community engagement efforts, multicultural education, supporting the dive-in team, which is our internal team of staff, as we examine the different processes and policies that we're responsible for and many, many other things. It'll just be glad and great to have their voice as part of our team. So with that, Gabby has a few words to introduce themselves, and I'll turn it over to the podium. Oh, you got to go back. We trick, that was the trick. It was already <laughs> That around. was the prank. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Gabby. My pronouns are they, them. I'm so excited to be joining the city. Um, to me, DEI efforts are very much community building and an act of collective compassion. So I'm just so excited to be here and continue the amazing work that's already been done and support new efforts to build community and create an equitable and inclusive city for us all. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gabby. It's really nice to have you here. All right, next up we have council committee reports. Council Member Zorns? <laughs> it's feast or famine with me. So, you know, go, go get a cup of coffee. I'm going to go through. <laughs> <laughs> and go through my reports here. Uh, let's start with NPRSA. Uh, Bill Hagen, is that, am I saying his last name correctly? Hogan? Hogan. Hogan. Uh, Seattle University Athletic Director is now par, is he chair, he's chairing the uh, uh, Center for Youth Excellence. We had a chance to meet him. We have a new chair which is James McNeil. And um, as far as I know, Rod Dombowski is the vice chair. So there we go on that. We got a, a summation on capital repair updates. They're um, being really uh, grounded on what we can do and what we can't do. HVAC came under budget, which is a great thing. Anytime you can come under budget. Um, and we did a tour of the senior center and we, before they did an envelope investigation, and we were all kind of holding our breath because it was not looking good. But thankfully, uh, after they did an investigation, it was all cosmetic, cosmetic and there's no structural damage, so big sigh of relief there. There is a uh, water leaking under the crawl space of the Health and Wellness Center, and they are going to be testing for fecal matter, which means it's sewer that's the source of water in the crawl space. And they're going to be testing to floor, for fluoride, which means city water is leaking underneath the building. And if it's neither, then it's groundwater that's coming up underneath the building. And uh, that was pretty much it. Nathan Phillips gave us an update. It's a new phrase that I had not heard before called super age that says by the year 2028, 20% of our population is going to be over 65, 65. 
and um, and then King County awarded NPRSA. We got the money uh, May 11th, $350,000 for a site feasibility study, which is kind of cool. So that's NPRSA. So now to uh, RIA 8. Um, we mostly got uh, the first part of the meeting was funding updates for all our projects. Um, we uh, got updates on um, some of the programs that are in the Bothell area. One is Whale Scout that got, has funding from um, uh, RIA Aid, and that is for providing interim intern support. And I think Brittany said that it's five individuals that it supports for intern work. And then Friends of North Creek Forest got $35,000 for outreach and education. And the total was $5.6 million from coming from Raya 8. Um, and then uh, Lauren Jurgensen gave us a predation of juvenile Chinook. And we went through South Lake Washington, Lake Sammamish, North Lake, uh, or uh, the north of the lake and the Ship Canal. And surprisingly, in the Sammamish River, predation is less of a problem. But uh, the yellow perch, which has just been growing population uh, astronomically, they, their, their favorite thing that they love to eat is um, the uh, juvenile Chinook. So if you have a hankering to eat yellow perch, <laughs> Go, go fishing. Um, and then we got a, a presentation on Meadowdale Beach Estuary Restoration. That's kind of my home turf where I did most of my growing up. And seeing that whole area restored as an estuary is pretty fantastic. If you need a summer project, go down to the um, Meadowdale Beach Estuary. And then LTAC. We went, we were just basically onboarding our new folks. They are great folks that we've got uh, that are serving. Most of that was onboarding and we looked at budget considerations and we'll be digesting what we, how we want to approach budget um, this fall. And briefly back to um, uh, Raya 8 was, uh, we were all encouraged to um, attend uh, King County Stormwater Park Summit. And there was a lot of fantastic information that came through, and I'll try to go through it really quickly. There's four action goals. Uh, create regional stormwater parks. 30 is, uh, um, they're going to be, um, I think it's 30 stormwater parks that we're going to be working on. And uh, treat polluted runoff from runways, uh, uh, runways, <laughs> roadways. And restore the natural flow and look at up, uh, controlling upstream source of toxic pollution, which got me to, gets me to um, something that I thought, Claudia Balducci, she made a comment, and I thought it was something that all of council should hear. And she made the com comment that storm water should be threaded throughout our comprehensive plans, think holistically. And one of those pieces that uh, she was mentioning, I was going to give you a quote from her. Uh, uh, there are co-benefits co in addition to the stormwater parks with smaller green spaces. Also, they also provide respite, recreation, and uh, it's an opportunity that you, we need to be careful that we don't miss in our planning. And that is the sum of my meetings. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to tag on uh, the NPRSA. Um, we're uh, looking to have a joint meeting coming up uh, here soon, uh, hopefully in July. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the Senior Center is an amazing asset that we have here in our community. Um, and it doesn't just serve uh, Bothell seniors, but it serves seniors around the region. Um, and there's a lot of programming and services that are happening within the Senior Center, and hopefully we have an opportunity to have them come and present to us all of the amazing things that they're doing there. But we wouldn't be where we are today um, without the community um, and the levy that was passed. Uh, but more importantly, city staff that has worked tirelessly uh, implementing the, the resources from the community to continue to keep our senior centers open. So I, I just wanted to um, give a shout out to Christine, Barbara, and our assistant city manager, Becky, 
for the amazing work that you have done uh, on behalf of our community and our seniors um, in keeping that facility open and running because without it, uh, there'd be a lot of seniors that would, uh, would not have places to go. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Councilmember Dodd. Thank you. Um, tangentially related to that, actually. Um, so I uh, have been on the board of the Snohomish County Transportation Coalition, which is now becoming its own 501c3 versus um, working under another organization. And I will be the board president um, when that organization forms, which is exciting. Um, and through Snowtrack, I was able to connect with Cliff Perry, who runs the transportation program at the North Shore Senior Center. And I met with him, um, gosh, almost two weeks ago to get an update on just how the program works. Um, they're always seeking drivers. And um, it, instead of during the pandemic, they were taking meals to seniors. And now they're bringing seniors to the facility. Um, a lot of the funding has changed. And, and Cliff mentioned, um, and I think we've all seen this in different areas of the local government, that it's almost harder to pull out of the pandemic than it was to shift into it. Um, so I would just encourage all of you to, to reach out and learn more about what the Senior Center is doing if you're not familiar. Um, the transportation program is really exciting, but there's um, some limits to it. So learning more about what we're doing regionally and because of Snowtrack, I have a lot of knowledge about Nohomish County and, um, and kind of how it dovetails into um, the Senior Center, which obviously covers a lot of places not in Snohomish County, um, but there's Omaha Senior Services out of Linwood. Um, there's a lot of really great programs. So um, just wanted to provide that update on Snowtrack and encourage you to um, just really dig into the services that are available. Because I think as we're out talking to folks, knowing options that you can provide for them is really, really helpful. Um, so yeah, thank you. All right, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Deputy Mayor. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. I've got a motion from the Deputy Mayor and a second from Council Member Zorns to approve the consent agenda. Would anybody like to speak to the motion? Seeing none, City Clerk. Please say yes or no. Please say yes or no when I call your name, Council Member Zorns. Uh, yes. Mayor Thompson. Yes. Council Member McNeil. Yes. Council Member Mankey. Yes. Council Member Dodd. Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra. Yes. Passes 6 0 with Council Member Aldrich's absent and excused. Thank you so much, City Clerk. All right, before we move on to our next agenda bill in the public hearing, we're going to take a quick five minute break. It is 7 05 p.m. I will see you back here at 7 10. All right, welcome back. It's 7 10. Um, next up, we have agenda bill 23082 Canyon Park Transfer of Development Rights Program. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. This is the first of two public hearings that we have scheduled tonight. They'll both sound uh, very familiar to Council, I'm sure. Uh, for this one, we had a study session on May 16th and then are coming back tonight for, uh, for the public hearing. Uh, you'll hear later, too, that then we're anticipating coming back for, counsel, uh, for Council action next week. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our Deputy Director of Community Development, Ashley Winchell. Hi, tonight I'm joined by Rick, Rick Kapka and Gary Yao with Sound Transit, um, and also Andrew Bjorn with Burke. So as uh, City Manager Stannert mentioned, we are here in May to talk to you all about the Transfer Development Rights Program. We're going to do a really high level overview tonight, um, and then are happy to answer any additional questions you may have, and then of course open it up for the public hearing. So again, um, Following um, the hearing tonight, we'll be seeking direction for you, from you all of uh, whether you would like to have continued conversations or final action um, on June 13th uh, at the next city council meeting. So the transfer development rights program was first uh, thought of in the Canyon Park sub area plan. Um, it was anticipated by three land use policies. Um, and one of the reasons that we've decided to move forward with this implementation measure. Um, Deputy Director, I'm sorry. Um, I don't believe I formally opened the public hearing. Do I need to do that now or is? You can do it after the presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so one of the reasons we're, we're pursuing this now is, as you all know, 
Bus Base North is proposed in Canyon Park. Bus Base North is needed to implement some of the bus rapid transit that's coming to Bothell. And so um, the Bus Base North site um, and proposal by Sound Transit, it's an essential public facility, um, and there are um, certain allowances by state law in which we need to make sure that these are permitted in our city boundaries, but then there's also operational characteristics of the bus base that prevent it from meeting the Canyon Park sub-area plan requirements, uh, specifically some of the uh, floor area ratio requirements um, that were um, put in place by that sub-area plan. So what is transfer of development rights or TDR, which I will probably slip into TDR several times in this presentation if I haven't already. So transfer of development rights, um, it's essentially a program that allows us to take the unused development capacity of ascending area um, and it can then be purchased and used to augment development capacity of a receiving area. So the map you see on screen, this is the proposed uh, areas for our um, our transfer development rights program. The hatched area is a sending site. We only have one sending site in Canyon Park and that is the bus base north site. The blue sites are receiving sites and these sites were chosen by reviewing um, the existing sub area plan, environmental impact statement and doing additional traffic analysis to make sure that wherever these uh, unused credits were transferred to would have minimal impacts on the existing environmental impact study and proposal of the Canyon Park sub area plan. So sending sites are those certain lots that are eligible to transfer development rights to a receiving site. So not every site in Canyon Park will be eligible to take their unused development capacity and transfer it elsewhere. Um, again, this is being put in place for essentially government uh, entities that cannot um, for operational reasons, meet the floor area ratio requirements of the Canyon Park sub area plan. Um, we did not want to necessarily put this in place for any type of development that just didn't want to um, meet our floor area ratio or other requirements. We really wanted to make sure that there were special circumstances in which this could be used. Receiving sites are where these credits could be sent. Um, and so they would need to apply for a certificate of, uh, or they would need to receive a certificate of TDR receipt. Um, additionally, one thing that's a little bit confusing is that a sending site may also be a receiving site. Um, so essentially Canyon Park could, or Canyon Park, this is all Canyon Park. The bus space north could sever the development rights from their site. And then let's say 10 years from now, they decide they wanted to add something to the site and those credits haven't been used. They could actually transfer them back to the site. So how does this work? So essentially the sending site will apply for and receive a certificate of TDR availability from the city. A certificate of TDR availability is essentially just a letter from us telling the developer how much capacity they will have left over after their development. Um, then they would have to use a TDR or transfer development rights covenant registered to the parcel to sever the development rights on the site. So essentially when future property owners come to buy it, they see that that covenant's in place and that they actually have maybe less development capacity than they would have if they just read the, the um, Bothell Municipal Code. And then the city will keep a registry of where these credits are. So who owns them, how many are out there, have they been used, et cetera. So that way, as they get used over time or transferred to new entities, we know where these live. Um, which is very important because these aren't necessarily tangible. It's, you know, not an actual piece of land. It's kind of a theory of credits of developable area. And so we need to make sure we're tracking that. For the receiving site, um, the owner would purchase the certificate of TDR receipt from the TDR holder. So essentially in this case, if Sound Transit is the TDR holder, a developer would purchase these um, purchase the certificate of TDR receipt from them. They would then provide a statement about the transfer development rights uh, used with their permit applications for approval. Um, once the permit's approved, then that would essentially transfer those development rights to that site. And we would update our registry documenting the ownership of uh, certificates. So they don't have to sell all of them. They could sell some of them. They could sell all of them. Um, but we just want to make sure that we're always updating our registry so we know where these live. 
So that was a very quick summary. I know we spent a lot more time on it in the study session. I do have all of the slides from that presentation as well if you want to go back to anything or have any additional questions. Um, and then um, we also have Sound Transit here and our consultants with Burke uh, to answer any questions about the proposed code. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, remind you all of is we will be working, uh, if this is approved, we'll be working with Sound Transit on an interlocal agreement, which really we'll get into once these um, credits are severed from the site, how will Sound Transit be tracking, marketing, um, and uh, reporting back to us on, on the availability. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions about um, the Transfer Development Rights Program. Mayor Thompson, could you formally open the public hearing? Thank you. I formally open the public hearing. Councilor Jones. I know. I'll just while you all are forming your your thoughts here, I'll I'll leap leap in. I did read the letter from um, Van Ness Feldman on questions that they had, and I think I. Um, well, one question that I know I didn't um, address uh, in in the rest of what you provided for us is SEPA threshold not done yet. There was a concern that the SEPA threshold hadn't been done yet, and the th or the analysis had not been done yet. And is there a reason for that? We have uh, so that letter is was actually sent um, to Planning Commission, I believe, in December. Okay. So since then, we have completed. Uh, the SEPA analysis, Perfect. we uh, uh, ended up uh, adding additional information to the Canyon Park EIS. That appeal period has closed and we did not receive any comments or appeals on okay. that. Okay, there we go. So now my questions and I'll try to keep them as um, undisjointed as possible. Um, the five years from issuance on the TDR is just when someone takes those uh, receiving so this is yes this is probably the most confusing part of the code um, okay. so the certificate of availability is essentially just a letter indicating if you do this development this is how much credit you will have available it, nothing is permanent until it's made uh, a part of the covenant and so we wanted to make sure that these letters didn't live forever because codes can change developments can change things can change and so we um, essentially someone could apply for this letter come in a few later a few years later and something could have changed that we could actually say that letter isn't valid anymore we need to update it so it was just putting an expiration date on the availability okay um, so if they waited too long they would need to apply for that again before they could record the covenant but it doesn't mean that if these aren't used within five years that the credits disappear or go back to the main property. Okay, and it, and it has nothing to do with who bought the bought the development rights on it, only having five years. It's the person who's developing it that has the TDR attached to it. Yes, until okay. they record the covenant, it's just a letter letting them know how many of these credits they could sever from okay. the site. Okay, and they got five years. They have five years to do it. Okay, all right, that helps, thank you. Um, and, And then I think you also answered the question um, that if uh, somebody has covenant, uh, develops below what the full development is and that has a TDR on it, they could come back later and add to their property if they have not sold those, yes. those TDR rights to someone? Okay, yes. which leads me to my next question. How do you price the development rights? I'm going to pass that to Andrew, who I think is probably anticipating that getting passed. <laughs> yes. Um, so this was a very interesting question that we had to study as part of the report. Um, I'll try to make this as brief as possible, and then I, I, I can add more detail as, as necessary. We coordinated an examination of the King County um, TDR system, which is different, but it ends up um, that it can also be bought for additional development capacity. 
We also examined uh, pro forma assessments of what development could occur in the Canyon Park area and provided a general estimate about what developers might be willing to pay given certain conditions. Um, as you well know, you know, the real estate market right now is different uh, than, it, than it has been over the past few years with interest rates increasing. Um, the development calculus has changed somewhat. In the longer term, however, what we're looking at is that if rents continue to increase, then uh, development would be more feasible and people would want to uh, purchase at uh, the rates that we're generally identifying. What we did also incorporate in here as a suggestion is that not all of the credits should be on sale at once, that there is a check valve involved, that mm. um, somebody can't scoop everything up if they think that it's a bargain, that uh, if there's a certain amount that's purchased, then there's a stop to uh, the sales and they can be repriced as necessary. In addition, um, if they go for five years or so without being sold, then there's a there should be a mechanism in place to allow for um, a repricing of those, uh, of those credits. So those were the recommendations that we have provided. Um, what I should note here is that uh, with the ordinance, we're not intending for that part of the process to be part of the ordinance itself. Uh, this is more suited to both the city's internal processes as well as the interlocal agreement that would be between Sound Transit and the city about how to manage the credits. Okay. Well, you as you were explaining it to me, a question popped up in my head, and you must have been must have been anticipating it because no. then you answered it. So, I appreciate Great. that. Thank you. Those uh, are the best questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are the best answers. Um, and uh, I hope that I am. I don't know if I'll find. I've buried somewhere in here that uh, g the government, there was a comment about the government be being, having access, let's see, oh, here it is. It's on page 131 of our agenda packet. It's um, uh, point G sub point three that said, uh, any receiving site obtaining transfer of development rights shall be issued, da 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 da. Um, including without limitation any applicable government restriction. What does that mean? Because I had a thought go through my head that I thought I need some clarification. So essentially, okay, couldn't tell if my mic's on. Uh, so essentially Sound Transit has certain uh, governmental requirements for the surplusing of their property. And those requirements would also transfer with the credits they are selling because it's essentially real property. Okay. So um, I believe it's the 80-20-20 rule about um, selling certain surplus properties for affordable um, housing. Some of those requirements may be placed on the credits that are for sale um, per Sound Transit's, um, I don't know if it's their bylaws or, or the rules in which they operate in surplus property, surplusing property. And so that was something we worked with Sound Transit on adding to the ordinance to make sure that it was clear that um, we couldn't tell them they couldn't do that because that would put them um, not in compliance with their own rules and regulations. Okay. And and this, this applies only for uh, TDR certificates that are moving around Canyon Park. They can't be transferred to another project outside of Canyon Park. No, they could not be transferred outside of Canyon Park because the intent was to make sure that the activity units stay in Canyon Park so that we stay in compliance with the Regional Growth Center framework provided by the Puget Sound Regional Council and established by the Canyon Park sub-area plan. Okay, well, it sounds like you thought of everything. So, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? I guess not. Um, I have a question. Um, you know, as, as we go through this, so uh, what will happen is Sound Transit will have these development rights that they can then 
uh, retain and sell on the open market. I'm wondering if, because it it seems like we're mostly doing this simply to make it so that Sound Transit can actually build a bus uh, maintenance facility here. Um, and the city on those 12 acres won't get any property tax revenue forever because that's an essential public facility. Is there a way that the city could retain those development rights so that when they're sold, uh, the Bothell residents that will be footing the bill for maintaining all of the infrastructure around the bus barn can benefit from it? So essentially, we would keep we would keep the development, we would own the development rights versus Sound Transit? Yes. That is something we had talked about and I believe that there were some issues in terms of Sound Transit's, I might pass that off to Sound Transit because I think there were some issues with who owned those rights in the long term and that, or who owned those rights in the interim and how I think, is this, sorry, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Evening council members and thank you Deputy Director Ashley for trying to help answer some of this <laughs> sound transit specific questions. Um, I think that is a model that we have looked at before. Um, to Andrew's point, um, that's something that we could potentially contemplate as part of the interlocal agreement. Um, there are some challenges, um, you know, the uh, process aside, there are also some, um, I think, uh, challenges, um, Not maybe not necessarily challenges, but certainly um, with the city's um, holding on to the development rights themselves, um, there would be kind of a higher level of administration and whatnot that uh, might be required of, of city staff. And certainly in terms of uh, the administration of the development rights, um, we would definitely work together with city staff in crafting a uh, interlocal agreement for city council review so that um, we can ensure that the development rights go towards an outcome that is beneficial for the city. Um, I'll note that Sound Transit, as obligated by the RCWs and also by our own board policies as well, um, is required to prioritize its surplus property, which would include any surplus development rights um, for affordable housing. And to Mayor Thompson, your question earlier about, you know, where does the money go? Um, in terms of the situations where credit, TDR credits are actually sold um, for development, uh, for for-profit development, there we would be obligated under those statutes um, for those types of development rights um, to use the proceeds from uh, sales of those TDR development rights. Uh, for use towards affordable housing that's located within uh, half a mile of a light rail or a transit station. So um, I think there's some certainly some upcoming conversations about um, how that all, all works in a little bit finer grain detail. Okay, thank you. Is that something we can follow up on city manager after the fact? Perfect. All right. I don't think there's any required action on this, is there? No, go ahead, Paul. There is a um, required action to um, just post the public hearing, staff seeks direction to return to council on 613, that's your only required action. And could you also inquire whether members of the public would like oh, to comment? Oh, that's right, too. Yes, Sorry. would any members of the public like to comment? There was nobody signed up to speak. I don't know. If there's anyone online, that was my next thing. If there's anyone online, please use the raise your hand function. I'm not seeing anyone. All right, so staff seats direction to return to council on June 13th for action. Anybody uh, think that's not a good idea? 
And Mayor, I might also add, so with this will have been the second time we've had questions. There was no, no one from the public with council concurrence. We would also suggest adding that to the consent calendar. I see, I see lots of nodding. We all okay with that? Cool, I think, I think we got everybody nodding up here. All right, do you have everything you need? Yes. Awesome, fantastic. In that case, we're going to move on to Agenda Bill 23083. Oh, and thank you, everybody, <laughs> offline, online. Um, the Review of Planning Commission Findings and Recommendations on Proposed Outdoor Dining Regulations. City Manager. Thank you. So this is our second public hearing. Again, very familiar. The councils uh, discussed this item back on May 9th uh, as a study session and several times over the past uh, couple of years as it's come back, but this, the aim of this action is to make some uh, more permanent uh, regulations. We're going to hear a little bit more and again open it up for public comment if there is any uh, after a short staff presentation, which will be led by our senior planner, Kirsten Mann, and from Community Development. So Kirsten, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm just getting it in here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right, so we are here tonight to hold the public hearing for the outdoor dining regulations we discussed back in May, as City Manager Standard mentioned, and uh, similarly to the TDR public hearing, we are seeking direction on bringing back uh, this topic for final action at the June 13th City Council meeting. So many of these slides will look the same. It's essentially what we talked about back in May. Um, so quick overview, again, back on June 9th in 2020, we adopted the interim ordinance to permit outdoor dining in private uh, parking areas and other private areas on site. Subsequent six-month extensions were granted uh, for a number of, number of times, the latest one being in November, of, November 15th of 2022 with the intent to adopt permanent regulations. And uh, we held our study session back on May 9th as council, uh, as City Manager Standard mentioned, and we have also since issued the SEPA determination and no uh, appeals or uh, comments were received on that. Does not wanna go to the next slide. All right, so again, citywide amendments that were included were to establish a standard size allowance. This was based on the tents we've seen uh, that tend to be really typical. We wanted to make sure that we weren't triggering new requirements by the allowance of an expanded uh, facility. We wanted to make sure we were retaining green space, particularly in parking lot areas for a various number of reasons, including aesthetics, stormwater, um, and some other things. In terms of sub area specific amendments, because we do essentially have three different zoning codes, uh, we wanted to make sure we were capturing the citywide code changes in Canyon Park as well as downtown. And that is, again, just kind of mirroring those citywide amendments. Uh, specific to downtown, we wanted to address the existing facilities at Julio's and the Cottage and some of the unique challenges that are, um, that are associated with downtown parcels and some of our older de developed areas. So one of those being to use those parking stalls without requiring additional parking minimums that are triggered by the tents or for what's there. And then it, again, a quick presentation. We've talked about this. We didn't have any changes from the last study session. Uh, just seeking direction on go, coming back for final action next week. With that, I'll open up to. And I would like to open the public hearing. <laughs> Mayor, before going to council, would you like to see if there's anybody from the public who wishes to speak? Would love that, yes. To get that done. We did not have anyone signed up to speak. However, is there anyone in the audience or the virtual audience that does wish to speak? Please use the raise your hand function or step up to the podium. I'm not seeing anyone. Thank you, City Clerk. Council, any questions? I too do not have any questions. We had a study session about this a little while ago. All right. 
bring back final action for council consideration at a future meeting. Great, thank right. you. We'll be back next week. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Planner Matt. Oh, yeah. Is that an item that can go on the consent agenda? Yeah, we'll, we'll plan on bringing it back there. All right, thank you. I mean, with no questions from council this time, it seems pretty safe to put it on consent for next time. All right, next up we have Agenda Bill 23084, Approval of Professional Services Agreement with Parametrics for the Design of the Canyon Ridge Estates Pond Retrofit. City Manager. All right, this is one, uh, one contract and agreement on the agenda tonight for consideration. Um, and we are going to hear tonight from our surface water engineer, Robert Holbrook, to present and answer any questions before council is asked to consider approval of the contract. So we'll get presentations tuned up and off to Robert. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. I'm here today on behalf of the Public Works Utility and Development Services Division to seek your approval to start design for a stormwater pond retrofit project. Specifically, the Council action is the Council action we are seeking is to approve the professional services agreement with Parametrics for the design of the Canyon Ridge Estate Pond Retrofit. This project is a was, is contained within the adopted 2023 to 2029 Capital Facilities Plan and funded in the adopted 2023 to 2024 budget. To best explain the need for this project, I will provide a brief history, the purpose of the project, the current funding status, and if approved, next steps. The stormwater pond in Canyon Ridge Estates is located on 232nd Street Southeast and 23rd Avenue Southeast. It's just north of Canyon Park Middle School. On the map there, it's the dark blue dot just above the green square. The pond was originally constructed as part of the development in 1984, and it was later annexed by the city, and the city inherited ownership and interim maintenance of the pond. When it was originally constructed, it provided flow control in accordance with the requirements at that time. However, the pond does not include any water quality treatment to, per to remove pollutants and does not meet current flow control standards. The pond is identified as a retrofit opportunity within our Stormwater Management Action Plan, the SMAP. The SMAP is one of the new requirements listed under the Phase 2 Municipal Stormwater Permit. Uh, Lower North Creek was chosen as our prioritized watershed basin for SMAP develop development. And projects and programs were identified within the SMAP to improve stormwater treatment from existing development within this priority watershed. The Canyon Ridge Estates is an excellent candidate for a retrofit project because it includes a contributing area of 27 acres, 14 of which are impervious surface, and seven of which are pollutant generating impervious surface. Our intention is to add both water quality and flow control to the existing stormwater pond in the Canyon Ridge Estates neighborhood. The design will include only improvements that are feasible within the existing footprint of the pond and the roadside ditch on 23rd Avenue. Water quality will focus on removing pollutants such as heavy metals, sediments, and known contaminants such as 6-PPDQ, which is a byproduct of the t tire dust, which is detrimental to a lot of aquatic life, extremely so to coho salmon, which will additionally be addressed in the next Phase 2 Municipal Stormwater Permit, so it'll help Bothell kind of get a step ahead on that game. Flow control will focus on containing the flow for longer periods of time to allow for further settling and to reduce the impacts of the wetland downstream from heavy flows. Additionally, this will provide benefits to the city as it will allow the city to meet the SMAP requirements and allow the city to meet retrofit requirements as outlined in the NPDES permit. Staff sought funding for the design and was awarded in a Department of Ecology grant in 2021. During this initial grant application, the design cost was estimated to be just about $145,000. Ecology's contribution to that total would be 75%, which is the $108,000 listed on the slide. Current design efforts is expected to cost $200,215.07, which would require an additional contribution by the city of about $55,000 to 
for a total of 91,000 listed on the slide. The storm and surface water utility has sufficient funds to cover this increase. And in accordance with finance, a budget amendment would be included in the mid-biennial amendment in the fall. If the agreement is, is approved, the consultant would, be, would complete design and permitting with an expected completion date in 2024. Additionally, the city will be eligible for construction funding from the Department of Ecology as well. And staff anticipates to bring the construction contract and budget to council for approval in 2024. On behalf of the Public Works Utility and Development Services Division, I'd like to request council's approval of the professional services agreement with parametrics for the design of the Canyon Ridge Estates Pond retrofit. Thank you for your time. And I can answer any questions. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. I just wanted to uh, clarify something. You mentioned in that pie chart with the funding between the Department of Ecology and the city, you mentioned uh, they cover, they're supposed to cover 75%, or you mentioned the 75% figure, but it's not matching here. Yeah, the 75% initial figure was for the initial design agreed upon in 2021. The design estimate that came back recently in 2023 was $200,000, which is about $50,000 over budget, which would require the city to provide the additional funds. Oh, that means the Department of Ecology will reduce, which means that because we're putting in more that total they approved, or yeah. the grant is less now. Yeah, so at this point, it would uh, college would cover about 54%. Thank you. Council Member Zorns. Um, when we actually go to, after we've designed and we're going to build this, what about is the cost that we, we are anticipating that we'll have to spend on this ballpark range? It, it's really tough to say without like initial pit infiltration test for the pond to see what could be included. But I would expect the city's contribution because ecology would match 75% to be less than $500,000. Okay. Um, and I d so appreciate, uh, because that was one of my questions is, could you, uh, you know, describe the water quality treatment and you told me what you're looking for. So my next question is once that water is treated, does it go in a sewer pipe somewhere like to one of the creeks or what happens with the water that's in that pond? Go back a couple of slides here. So uh, after the water's treated, it goes out to a uh, stormwater pipe, which outfalls to a small wetland, which eventually is carried down to North Creek. So, so it goes from a wetland and then is conveyed down to North Creek. So in in practicality, it has a chance to be filtered yet again before it enters the stream, which is fantastic. Correct. Okay, thank you very much. Councilmember Mankey. Thank you, Mayor. I just have one question about historical, um, not significance is not the right word, the historical history of, of this piece of uh, property in the drainage pond. Um, my understanding was that typically neighborhoods manage and maintain their own drainage ponds, and um, I don't know if this one is an exception to that rule when Snohomish County was um, unincorporated at that point in time. I'm curious how we kind of came into possession of it as a required responsibility to maintain and how it did not stay under a neighborhood HOA or something similar to that. Yeah, so uh, back in 1984, county requirements didn't require uh, developers or developments to maintain the stormwater pond, so it fell to the county. And then when it was annexed by the city, we inherited that maintenance and the property as well. Okay, great. I just wanted to ask that quick question. I don't know if anybody's watching or anybody pays attention to these things, but typically these days, they're mostly contained within an HOA and a private property. I know these are uh, city streets as well, so um, they're maintained by the city. Uh, we're responsible for that upkeep, which is not traditionally how it's done now, too. So thanks for answering that question. Just uh, it's kind of a side curiosity. Yep, no problem. If uh, nobody else has any questions, I will happily uh, entertain a motion. Councilmember Mankey? Uh, I move oh. to Councilmember Dodd, you didn't have anything to say, right? I was going to make the motion. Okay, perfect. Well. 
I call on Council Member Mankey first. Uh, I move to approve the professional services agreement with Parametrics for the design of the Canyon Ridge Estate Pond Retrofit. Second. All right, I've got a motion from Council Member Mankey and a second from Council Member Dodd to uh, approve the recommended action. Would anybody like to speak to the motion? Seeing none, City Clerk. Please say yes or no when I call your name. Council Member Zorns? Yes. Mayor Thompson? Yes. Council Member McNeil? Yes. Council Member Mankey? Yes. Council Member Dodd? Yes. Deputy Mayor Alcabra? Yes. Pass the 6 0 with Council Member uh, Aldirks absent and excused. Fantastic. Thank you, City Clerk. Thank you, everybody. Um, we are going to break for 10 minutes to set up for a study session here in Chambers. Um, we're actually going to break for 12 minutes. It's 7.48. Um, I will see everybody back here at 8.10 p.m. Oh, sorry, at 8 o'clock p.m. 12 minutes. I did that wrong. That list is Agenda Bill 23085, a study session for the Valhalla Utility Project Budget Amendment. City Manager. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, we have three study sessions tonight. This first one, we, we started out earlier tonight, and Councilmember Zorns was giving us an illustration of how do you identify the source of water. Um, in this case, uh, we're really uh, talking about also funding sources as well. So um, here with a, an overview of something that, again, we've had a few things tonight that are familiar to council. In this case, it'd be familiar to you in that it's been part of your capital facilities plan. Um, but to, to walk you through some uh, proposed funding changes, I'm going to first turn things over to our public works director, Erin Lenhart. Thank you, city manager, and good evening, mayor and council. Um, I'm just going to say just a quick few things before I turn it over to Robert and Boyd, who are going to actually give you the meat of the presentation. Um, the ultimate goal for this conversation is to um, have council award a construction contract to move forward with this much needed um, improvement project um, in a neighborhood. Um, it's been complicated because of accounting, really. Um, there, we have three different utilities that we will be working on as part of this project, and those three utilities have three separate enterprise funds. So when we originally budgeted for this project, our crystal ball was a little cloudy and we didn't necessarily have all of the funds distributed as they turned out to be. So um, this may seem a little complicated, but it's really, it's really not. It's really a, a, an accounting exercise. So I just wanted to say that before I turn it over to Robert. Thank you for the introduction, Aaron. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council Members. I am here today on behalf of Public Works to seek your approval of a budget amendment to fully fund the construction phase of the Valhalla Utility Improvement Project. I will begin the presentation with an overview of the project, and Boyd will finish up with a discussion of the budget amendments necessary to fund the construction phase of the project. This presentation is being provided to gather feedback and provide the necessary information to allow Council to approve a budget amendment to fully fund the construction phase of the Valhalla Utility Improvement Project. No Council action is being requested this evening. The Valhalla neighborhood is located on the west side of Wainita Way Northeast, immediately south of the Wainita Way Bridge and directly across from the back nine of the former Wayne Golf Course. We have the uh, neighborhood here, um, the back nine of the Wayne Golf Course here, Wayne Ada Bridge, and Wayne Curve right here. Valhalla was initially platted and public utilities constructed in the early 1960s, making the utilities throughout the neighborhood approximately 60 years old. The main components, sorry, the Valhalla, excuse me, the main components of the Valhalla Utility Improvement Project include replacement of soft and failure prone asbestos cement water main, spot repairs to the sanitary sewer system to facilitate future cured in place pipe lining, and replacement of poorly performing storm pipes and structures. On the photo above, there is a picture of a poorly performing catch basin um, that's actually in a local high point, so there'll be some ponding around this before it collects water. And right here we have a separation of a sanitary sewer pipe which allows um, inflow and infiltration, stormwater, groundwater into the sanitary sewer system, which we have to pump when it gets to lift station one, which is also in the neighborhood. 
In, in addition, the project will also replace water meters, water service lines up to the meter, and provide a pavement overlay within the Valhalla neighborhood. This slide here shows the extents of the water improvements which are throughout the neighborhood, and that includes replacement of the asbestos cement water main, replacement of the service lines and meters, replacement of hydrants, and new air release valves at high spots. This slide here shows the extent of the storm drainage work, um, a lot more sporadic and spread out than the water main work. Um, it includes replacement and repair of deficient drainage structures and replacement repair of damaged storm pipe. And the status of the project now, the design was completed in March of 2023, went out to bid in April of this year. Fury Site Works has been identified as the lowest responsive and responsible bidder in the amount of $4 million. Construction is planned to begin in July of 2023 and go through May of 2024, pending approval of this budget amendment. <coughs> and installation of a gravity bypass line for lift station one will advertise and bid it at a later date. That was a separate component that was combined with this work, but later separated out. And Boyd, that's over to you. Thank you. So a bit of information about the funding for this. Um, the estimates for this project were completed initially back in 2021. And with the understanding that the budget was just passed recently, but uh, when we work on the capital facilities plan, we have to start very, very early. And since that time, we've seen some significant increases in construction costs and, and inflation related uh, impacts. So once we got to the budget <coughs> process in Q2, we did our best to understand how much money would be spent by the end of the year of 2022. And at that time, we had estimated that we'd get through all design um, and permitting. Um, that isn't the case, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then the last part is we had received a $4.65 million public works trust fund loan. And at that time, we had to basically, as, as Director Lenhart said, look in our crystal ball and say, how do we want to distribute these funds based on the need and the cost of the, of the, of the individual components of the work? So at that time, we had $815,000 to sewer. 2.96 uh, million to water and 900,000 to storm. So that was planned uh, for this budget amendment. What we're proposing to do is address a couple small issues. Uh, we had uh, design and permitting costs that we anticipated to spend in 2022 that that were not expended. So we'll finish that work, and we are finishing that work in 2023. So that those costs, about 300,000, weren't included in the 2023 budget. And then the construction bids for the water utility, the, the overall bids were very reasonable. We were very happily, uh, we were very pleased to see the bids come in, but the water component of the project, the cost of that was, was greater than estimated in the budget. A lot of that's due to um, cost of increase in materials, um, the inflation I mentioned. There's some additional, uh, the water portion of this is the largest part of the project. There's some additional uh, construction monitoring and cultural resources assessment. Uh, work in there as well. And then the last one we'll look at, oh, and the good news is uh, that the sewer work came in much lower, partially from the cure in place pipe work we're doing, and then the storm came in almost on on point. Uh, the last one is we're proposing to redistribute the loan revenue, and this is allowed um, by Commerce and the Public Works Trust Fund. And so since the sewer came in low, we'd rather allocate those funds to the higher cost water. Next slide, please. So this is a table that has a lot of numbers, and I'm just going to walk you through it. Um, please, I know I'll give you time at the end of this so you can please ask questions. So the 2023 budget, when we adopted it, we thought we'd be spending 5.3 million um, in 2023. Um, with the, the bids that came in, uh, it's closer to six, and you'll see the changes here. The sewer is much less, and once again, the majority of that is that when we initially looked at this back in 2021, we were still looking at open cut sewer replacement techniques, which are pretty expensive. Um, and then with council's approval, we had awarded the cure in place pipeline contract with uh, with Alderwood, which is a which is a very, very good value. So we saw significant reductions in cost there. Stormwater, pretty, pretty darn close, 1.182 and 1.202. Uh, and then the water, once again, that was the higher cost. And you'll see that all these costs for 2023, 6 million, that's not 4 million in the construction contract. That's the additional 280,000 in, in review work, and that's uh, additional uh, project 
management, it's the cultural resources, and it's an additional contingency. So we have those in there um, to make sure that we can complete the project. And what does this mean for the proposed amendment being brought forward? Well, first, um, on the far right column, you'll see we'd like to move the $815,000 in loan revenue um, from sewer into water. That's pretty easy. Um, and then you'll see the rest of these as you walk down. Uh, the question you'll hopefully ask when I take a pause is, uh, can the uh, water utility absorb these costs? Uh, the good news on that is that the increase in cost, once you take out the 815 in loan, is, is on the order of 350, um, and the water utility can do that. And the next question I hope you'll be asking is about the, the debt repayment. Um, it's it's, it's an increase from the, um, with the 815, but right now we're at 240000 a year for the next 20 years, and, and that's doable as opposed to like, I think it was 190 prior to that time. So that is kind of the uh, the meat of this, and then before I get to a summary slide, I'd really like to see if there's any questions or, or, or thoughts on this that I can address before we get to our last two summary slides. So the net net financial is, uh, it'll be about an extra $50,000, and that's coming out of our enterprise funds for the ongoing debt service? Yeah, this is a really good point. So once again, as uh, uh, both city manager and public works director mentioned, these are enterprise funds. Mm -hmm. um, we can't ship dollars between the funds, but we can reallocate do dollars within the funds. So yes, the extra the extra 40000 a year, let's say $50,000 a year, is coming out of the fund balance for water. And we've already ran this through our fund balance sheets and and yeah, as we've mentioned before, water is, is, is doing okay, and this doesn't make things appreciably worse. The alternative to this is to not do the project or, or, or something else, and so I think it's a, it's, it's a good approach. And the nice thing about using these loan funds, is it spreads costs out over time. We're, we're not, in the past, we've done a lot of cash basis work, save, 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 spend it all. Um, and that can result in some spiky rates and uh, more difficulty to forecast rates and revenue requirements, but with these loans, and I'm, I'm really keen to keep looking for, well, grants are the best, but additional loans, it really helps smooth it out and make it really, uh, yeah, anyway, other questions? Yeah, the cure in place, um, so is that, that 502, is that just the cured in place portion, or is that, I mean, we save that much on cure in place? So this is a, this is a good question, thank you, council member. Um, the the 645 is what we're spending on this project. So we estimated 1.147, and the 645 is that. So it is a it with the cure in, the cure in place contract is I think is 480, 490. So um, it, we're not really double dipping. But um, what I will say is that when we budgeted this, we budgeted the all the sewer work to come out of the sewer fund for this project. We also had the cure in place. We have 500,000 every two years. And what we did is we said, we're not going to do the majority of the sewer work as part of S14. We're going to do it as part of S3. So it, it's, it's still a great savings. It's not as super amazing as, as it looks um, because we're still doing the work out of a different project. Um, for the cure, uh, let me try this again. Uh, the cure in place is being funded out of S3 and that takes care of it. What's being funded here, the much lower number, is all the repairs that this project will do to make sure we can do the cure in place successfully. Okay, um, and just on an average number basis, what, what do you think it's a 10% savings, 15%? Um, this, that's a really good question as well. So um, when we looked at this with updated, if we had to trench all the sewer, we'd be looking at probably near $400 a foot. A cure in place is coming out to about 90 a foot. So it, it is an amazing savings. So if we weren't doing the cure in place, you'd see a much higher number on this project for the sewer replacement. Great, thank you, appreciate that. Two questions for me. Um, how many times can you cure in place a pipe or forget to replace it? I don't know the answer for that. I will say that um, I haven't been asked that and I haven't seen anything in the literature about that. But once you, you line a pipe, it is basically a new pipe um, but with a slightly, we were talking like three millimeters, so a slightly smaller ID. Um, there's no reason you couldn't add a new liner or, you know, a new insert pipe as long as you didn't get 
a cross-sectional area, you know, cross-sectional area that wouldn't allow the required flow. So since these are all eight-inch mains with pretty good slope, you could maybe do it multiple times uh, because it, it's not really adhering to the concrete; it conforms to it. But once they install the resin-impregnated fabric, um, and they basically Inflate's not the right word. Once it conforms to the size of the pipe, then they're just curing it with UV light, and it's it's pretty neat stuff. So it's it's very very rigid. Um, so there's no reason you couldn't do that unless you got to a point where you can strain the pipe so much that you didn't have an adequate flow. That's pretty amazing that we can do that. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, my other question was around. I know you mentioned doing a pavement overlay. Does that come out of street funds, or is that part of the utility work due to construction for the utilities? Another good question. So um, our standards require, our standards have been strengthening over time. And for development, if you impact uh, a road, you overlay it. And that's what the utilities have to do as well. So if the developers do it, the utilities have to do it. What's interesting about this project is there is quite a bit of disturbance with the water. You'll see the water main going in and all these site services and the same with the storm. Um, but working with uh, public works management, we, we looked at, okay, well, we can have all these small patches or with development, we typically extend them. And Robert looked at, okay, what's left? And there weren't huge areas. And, it, and it's quite often much cheaper to overlay something entirely as opposed to do a bunch of patches. So uh, transportation is, a, is chipping in $100,000 to help with that effort. And when this is done, you'll, you'll see pretty much new roads throughout, throughout the developments, which, which is good. Because it, it is way less expensive and it's way better performing to just do it all as opposed to chunks around. Okay, so 100,000 from transportation and is the rest covered by utilities? utilities? Yeah. Okay, is it spread equally among the, the three? Yeah, okay. actually the majority is for water. That's the other reason. Previously it would have been shared more if we were digging up other things with sewer and the rest, but that's, I, I believe that's the case, right? That's correct. Yeah. 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 Okay, great, thank you. Study session, you don't have to wait for me. I have a question about a different slide. It was with the uh, stormwater. It was the slide that highlighted the area. Yes. And I saw some of the <coughs> some of the parcels are also highlighted red. And I was going to ask about that. Yeah, there is one parcel there um, kind of on the curve there, um, bottom right, uh, right, right here. There is a, a transformer that settled on top of a pipe and it it damaged the pipe, and so that's going to be repaired as part of this project as well. Uh, I'm going to ask a question about the uh, the number slide. If that's okay. Uh, the table that you had. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, I have to uh, ask the question or make the comment. I hope Valhalla is not supposed to, because it's the gods heaven. <laughs> yeah. I was waiting for that. I, was, I, was gonna, I had to. I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't help myself. Just for you, Kyle. <laughs> what do we, I mean, you're moving money around from an account to account, which is OK. What is not on the slide? Like, what do we not? Because you mentioned something about uh, S3 funding, which triggered in my mind, like what, where are we moving more money? And do we have in the next budget cycle now ask residents for, to supplement that shortfall in other places? For sure. So let's, let's talk about S3, the cure in place pipe. Um, right now that's in the adopted budget for 500,000 every two years. And this is the project we selected once council gave permission to, to go. So it, it doesn't impact. We couldn't do another project. Um, it's a really good question. Uh, the bottom line on this is it's all sewer. It's all sewer funds. And so it really is, as uh, Director Lenhart said, it's an accounting exercise to, to demonstrate that we have the funds. So for sewer, there is no net impact. We're either doing the work out of S14 or we're doing it out of S3. And there still is an overall savings because of the cure in place pipe. For storm, uh, there is nothing there either. It's it's twenty thousand dollars, and we typically wouldn't even bring that forward because we don't have you know that's not policy. It's not required to bring that forward. That's below the threshold. We're showing that just to give you the complete story. For water, that's a different story. This is more expenditure. If we didn't have the loan, that would have been an additional one point two million 
out of the water utility, and it would be very hard to um, to fund that. We'd be making some hard choices. I think in the end we'd probably still do the project because this is a really high priority project. We're seeing failures out in the AC lane, but in this case we have the the loan to help offset that. So the the big one on that is it's the extra debt servicing, which we've already forecasted out past 2030, and we're okay, and it's the extra utility funding only, which is, like I said, on 300 to 350,000. So that, that's the whole story. And, and we had additional slides that had way more information on them, but they were way too confusing. But it, do you have more questions that I can address? Uh, no, this is, uh, this is helpful. If there is anything, I mean, we're, uh, this is, so if there's anything additional information, especially by, from an accounting perspective, what other Things. Like the slides you said that are confusing, if maybe you can send them, and they can be a part of the agenda packet for the next session. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, we I think we can we can work on getting yeah. that sent out to council ahead of probably not in the packet if they're that confusing, but we can because then that way there's only one way to explain them. And yeah. At the meeting, but we can share additional information with council and answer questions before it comes back. I, I trust you did all the background work. I just want to um, make sure that we're not missing anything yeah. as far as because I just worry about next year or whatever when we are doing budgeting again we're gonna say oh you know there's this additional money we have to now go to the residents and deputy yeah deputy mayor i think that was at the heart of your question too is would this any of the actions for this project impact rates going forward is that kind of yes. at the heart of what you're looking for yeah. Yeah, and and we can we can I can the reason I hesitated is not because I didn't want to answer the question, but even this plot we had deputy city manager have me look at this again because it's like you know it, I can it took me 15 minutes to get there, but I got there, and so we've really tried to make it more clear. So what I can do is I can do the same thing for the others, and it'll basically be one of the tables said, okay, well what does this mean for actual cost of the utility? And it's like I said, 350 whatever of fund balance plus an additional 40 a year and I can I can we can show that and I'll just be really careful to make sure that it's it's crystal clear because there are a lot of numbers and you folks know numbers but I don't want to cause more questions so we can do that for sure and the, the big one on this is the way we look at this and, and finance looks at this management looks at this is this does not impact our ability to do work uh, we do not see this as a significant increase in costs with respect to rates um, we had an amazing 2022 and when we get to the rate study we'll be sharing that but the revenue from development came in much higher than we anticipated for city charges so we're doing we're, we're doing pretty okay in the utilities with respect to that I like how you say said rates will not increase I, I didn't yeah well no and, and once again yeah it's, it's yeah. yeah no anyway that's the, that's the conversation when I think we need to have we already established the crystal ball sometimes get ha gets hazy. So making making that statement now would would be tougher. But I think what what I'm hearing from staff too is is that the project alone is not going to be the driver of that. It's still the holistic conversation. Correct. Thank you. Sorry, I just have to admit, talk about sewers, sewer pipes. I love it when you sit over here. You know, I, I you know. It was cool. I saw that pipe picture. I remember those conversations. Boyd has a gift for making sewer fascinating. <laughs> you know, and I don't know how he does it, but he does it. <laughs> it. It really is appreciated that you guys are interested in this. And what I'll say is that's, that's concrete pipe. It's in three-foot sections. It has no gaskets. So when you think about I&I, &I, inflow and infiltration, and that overburns our lift stations, that generates more wastewater that goes to the treatment plant, that more nutrients into Puget Sound, the reason we're doing the cure in place work and things like this is to demonstrate we're taking care of that extra inflow and infiltration and this this will do an amazing thing and that the lift station one that I'm sorry um, lift station one that that will be bringing back in the in the future that'll gravity bypass most of that flow and get that station back to what it was designed for to to, to pump sewage from Valhalla mm -hmm. um, so it's it, it's pretty interesting stuff so thank you for that comment thank you no, I, I like how you emphasize Valhalla, but uh, yeah. but yes, no, I, I love the, it's, it's I said it before, I say it again, it's extremely underappreciated work. It's all underground, behind the scenes, nobody sees it, but if it breaks, 
<laughs> help ex Lucy, you know, to yeah, use the I'm, other. I'm one. just going to jump in because I know you've got something to say. When it breaks, speaking from experience in my neighborhood, the roads go south real fast. And so as you're going. <laughs> When, uh, as you're talking about planning expenditures here, I just have an appreciation because if it's was our neighborhood a couple of years ago, and you've got you're planning carefully here, I half ex I half expect I I somewhat expect that a whoops you know something you're prioritizing neighborhoods that are going to need help. There's going to be someone who steps out of line, and um, it looks like you plan for that. So thank you. You do. Yeah, that's all Robert and the consultants, which is awesome. So um, we just have two summary slides. Do you? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I have a couple quick questions. But first, like I having this conversation with the deputy mayor around a neighborhood called Valhalla just makes me wonder what would have happened if we would have ended up in Medina on the city council instead of in Bothell. Because we'd, we'd, we'd be doing this all the time. I. Um, you don't have to. Sorry, bad joke. Um, question, um, are these utility failures we'll, we're seeing in this neighborhood out of the ordinary for a development of its age, or is it just, is this what happens? That's a good question. I'll, I'll answer it real quick, and Robert will add to that. But um, uh, AC, asbestos cement, water main, once again, when people hear asbestos, they think bad news. It's actually really good under certain soil conditions. It, it can last a long time, on the order of ductile iron. Um, in other soil conditions, um, it degrades. And I haven't seen this myself, but I've been reported to by operations that when they go out to make repairs, and you can look at the pavement and see how many repairs there are, the, the pipe is almost soft to the touch. Um, and it, AC asbestos fibers have a, a, a aspect ratio that's very large, so they're very long and you know, like fiberglass. So it, mm -hmm. it does okay, um, but this is, this is not something you'd see in an area where the soil is wouldn't react with the EAC main, or this was not something you'd see with ductile iron, where hopefully if we do a good job, it'll last 100 years. So 60 years of AC main is, is pretty darn good. Um, sewer is a different thing. Once again, most everything after, let's say, 1970, 75 is PVC. Mm -hmm. So it's gasketed and the rest. It's these older areas with the non-gasketed three-foot, it's not even reinforced concrete pipe, it's concrete pipe that that give us the headaches with respect to I and I and root intrusion and maintenance. You just gave the answer to my next question too, because I think of all of the Bothell that was built out in the 70s and 80s, and if this neighborhood in the 60s is representative of what's coming down the line for us, then we're in for a world of hurt. But it sounds like mid 70s or so, that's when that changed. Pretty much so, yeah. Okay. Um, the because I just look at you know I don't know how many homes are in Valhalla, but the cost per housing unit just to to do this work is is pretty up there and we need to do it. Like there's not a question, it's just this is the, I'm, I'm doing this because when we talk about the comp plan and we talk about planning for these long-term um, maintenance expenditures and trying to have a tax base that can support it, like this is, this is the kind of conversation that I think of where we're spending a significant amount of money um, on something, you know, 50, 60 years down the line. Um, cool. Okay, we have uh, two more summary slides and then uh, additional questions. So the budget amendment is to add 1.214 in expense. Um, the storm expenditures to add 20 in expense and then a reallocation of 815,000 of revenue from sewer to the higher cost water work. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our overall. So once again, the, the bids are reasonable. Um, we were very pleased with the bid award, or the, the hopefully uh, prospective bid award should council award the contract. Uh, we're asking to reallocate the funds. Um, the water and sewer, the water and storm funds have sufficient available resources to pay for these differences. Um, the approval of the budget amendment and bid award will allow completion of work. Without this, we will not be able to complete the work. Um, budget amendment rejection would stop the project, as you mentioned. And so uh, what we'll be bringing forward in the future is a request for council to consider that budget amendment. And right on the tails of that would be the, uh, or coincident with that would be the, the construction. Next week. Next week, bid award. <laughs> and I, uh, we have time for a couple of questions, and I think uh, Director Lenhart was going to close this out. How many communities do we have that are like this? 
not a lot. I don't know the number, um, but Valhalla is one of the first subdivisions in the city. And you think about the development, you know, we, we look at utility maps, it, it wasn't really like that. So it was one of the, the, the earlier developments. Um, I, can, I can do some research and just look. And what that would mean is basically looking at where we have AC water main mm -hmm. and where we have big developments. So I can, we can follow up on that. Yeah, it's more the, the question is more just forward thinking when we do these repairs, what are we looking at in the future for repairs coming like this, right? And then how do we get out in front of that to ensure that we're being proactive versus reactive to some of these problems that can happen? Um, and if if the hall is a, is a kind of its own development, but do we have any newer developments that would be coming down the pipe that would require the developer to do this work? So um, with our, our public work standards are pretty rigorous and that's basically from council and management direction. And so what you're seeing now with new developments, if they abutted Valhalla, let's say they abutted um, when you know, uh, they would be replacing mm -hmm. all this work, uh, not the interior, interior, but the frontage roads. So now when you see a new development that comes in, um, I'm trying to think of a yeah, sorry, I can't think of a real big one right now because Lot D was pretty well built out. But let's, let's say, uh, yeah, let's say Lot D, Alexan had um, a bunch of AC main or this or that. They would be removing and replacing that, and all their frontage is part of the developer requirement. And we're seeing the same with Storm, and the same oh, Ross Road. There you go, Ross Road. Mm -hmm. um, so the Ross Road apartments, uh, they were required to cure and place pipe. Um, line the sewer. Mm -hmm. uh, they were required to replace a bunch of storm and they were required to replace water on Ross Road. Some of that was actually facility charge eligible because it was on our, our list, mm -hmm. but that's what we'll see in the future. So development will be taking care of not only good quality infrastructure interior, but they'll be required to take care of the, uh, the frontage as well on the, on the public roads. And that in includes pavements. So it's now to the point where you know, if, if we have old standards and three-inch pavements, that's not the case. It's, uh, they'll be removing that and replacing that. And we've seen that pretty successful um, on other projects. Yeah, that just it gets back to the old uh, adage that uh, trying to create uh, affordable housing, the costs are, those are burdens that are going to be on that, that new housing, those new developments. So, thanks. Is the, the fact that this is on a pump system part of the reason that it's more urgent? Um, and maybe it wouldn't be so urgent if it was somewhere that wasn't on a pump system and had deficient sewer pipes. Yeah, and that's a really good point. One of the reasons this one floated at the top wasn't just the AC main, but it was the AC main and the sewer and the lift station. So it was one of these things, well, hey, we could nickel, you know, we could do these piecemeal or we could tie them all together and, and get economies of scale. And I think that's what we got. Yep. Yep. Is that lift station only for Valhalla? It was designed only for Valhalla. Yeah. It was retrofitted in the early 2000s to, uh, so it has the same wet well for Valhalla, same storage, but we, it was retrofitted by the city to increase the pumping capacity. And so typically you design these these stations to, to fill and pump. Maybe it's twice an hour. In this case, it's pumping very, very often because it's, as Robert pulled up, it's that, that whole drainage basin that wasn't envisioned uh, when Valhalla was built. So this is that gravity bypass which is, uh, it would come with this, but it has different permitting requirements. It'll take all of that and just shoot it down past the lift station across the bridge and uh, reduce the impact on the, and the burden on the lift station. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, which is cool. Any additional questions before Director Lenhart closes? Oh, and the last slide is we're seeking feedback. Um, for the few items here, 20000 for a storm, 1.214 for water, and the reallocation of 815000 in public works trust funds. And this will come back to you at a later date. Bring it back on consent. Yeah, I think we, we have one question in terms of um, the deputy mayor had some questions around the financials that I think we can make sure they're in included with the response, but we'll, okay. we'll plan on putting it on consent. And um, I want to be cognizant, too, of that we do the council member who's absent, so we'll reach out to council member Alex as well to see if she had any questions. I, I saw everybody looking at the screen. I'm good. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that was essentially what I was going to end with is 
the comfort level with consent and if there are additional questions. So, so this will be back to you next week. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Agenda Bill 23086 is the review of the 2024-2029 six-year transportation improvement plan. All right. Thank you, Mayor. And another one that will um, have some familiar tones, but we'll uh, walk through it. I know these can be, um, there's, a, there's a lot of moving, moving parts here, too, to keep straight. So uh, we'll be expertly guided. I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron Lenhart, our Public Works Director, to kick things off. Thank you, City Manager. Good evening again. Um, while Sherman pulls up his presentation, I wanted to provide a brief introduction to this. So the last item was about implementing a planned project, right? Uh, this is more planning phase. So council has already done the heavy lifting when it comes to transportation planning through the capital facilities plan process that you went through last year. And um, we had the planning committee and you know then the council that adopted that CFP. Uh, the, trans the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program, is a subset of the capital facilities plan that you've already generated. Um, and it's essentially, we're, we're checking a box that is required by um, one of our funding partners, um, that they want to see it in a different package than our capital facilities plan. So. See, I bought time for Mr. Mr. Gong. So um, I will hot seat once again and um, let Steve Morikawa take my chair and uh, turn it over to Sherman. All right, good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Council Members. My name is Sherman Gong. I am the City Transportation Planner. <clears throat> With me tonight, Steve Morikawa, Deputy Public Works Director. Uh, for tonight's study session, we will be discussing the proposed 2024 to 2029 six-year transportation improvement program to provide council with the opportunity to ask any questions regarding the program or the projects listed in it. Uh, I will briefly uh, discuss the process and then go over any changes between this year and last year's program. Uh, the purpose for this study session is for Council to provide feedback on the program and the projects in advance of the public hearing to be held for this item next Tuesday, June 13th. No other action is requested from Council today. Uh, the most recent Council actions taken include the approval of last year's resolution for the 2023-2028 six-year TIP in March which was followed by the approval of the resolution to adopt the 2023-2029 uh, capital facilities plan last October. <clears throat> For the benefit of council members that have not approved a TIP in the past, I would like to give a brief overview of what it is and some of the components it contains. So the TIP is an annual planning document required by the state that must be approved each year by July 1st. It lists projects and programs that the city uses to identify transportation-related efforts funded through the capital facilities plan process, and it is often required to show projects in order to be grant eligible. The TIP includes project and program list that also shows the funding identified for each project. It also includes a project map, as shown here on the left, uh, showing the location of projects within the city and the project descriptions uh, for each of those projects. Also included as an option is our uh, transportation needs list, uh, which also shows projects that have been identified as a need but are not yet funded. As I have been talking about the TIP, I've also been mentioning the capital facilities plan. The difference between the two is that the TIP must be updated annually where the CFP is updated biannually through, the, through an extensive public process and is a seven-year plan versus the six-year TIP. The six-year uh, TIP projects are actually adopted from the approved CFP project list and is essentially a subset of the capital facilities plan. So both the TIP and CFP include the transportation project and program list which have both essentially already gone through the public process. <clears throat> uh, 
the process of the CFP and TIP development is a two-year repeating cycle. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the TIP was last adopted in March of last year, and which is about the time we would typically bring this to council for review. Um, that was followed by the CFP committee and public process to develop the current CFP between March and September in 2022. Uh, the CFP then gets adopted usually in October or November. Uh, since the last TIP was adopted in March before the CFP process, this current TIP we are bringing now forward is essentially the same as last year's, but updated to include the current adopted CFP projects that were approved in October. Uh, next year's TIP will basically be an anticipated transportation project list based on uh, grant competitiveness and funding opportunities for projects and or are projects that are design ready or overlap other infrastructure needs and or are part of uh, previous project commitments. Next, I would like to talk about the changes between last year and this year's TIP. Uh, there, were two, there were two projects. Two projects that were listed in last year's TIP were removed. The SR-522 Stage 2B Improvements Project was removed and included as part of the new Sound Transit BRT project. And the other project is the 9th Avenue Pedestrian Improvements Project that was removed and now included into the new 9th Avenue Multimodal Improvement Project. A uh, total of nine projects were added to the TIP from last year's version. They include the North Creek FEMA Repairs Project, uh, Northeast 185th Street Utility and Roadway Improvements, Main and Festival Street Improvements, Kenyon Park Transportation Demand Management Program, uh, Downtown Sound Transit Access Program uh, Project on 104th Avenue Northeast, the East Riverside Drive uh, from 102nd, 100, East Riverside Drive Trail from 102nd Avenue Northeast to the East City Limits, 9th Avenue Southeast Multimodal Improvements, 228th to SR 524, uh, 35th Avenue Southeast Multimodal Improvements from 240th to 228th Street Southeast, and a bike box project on 104th Avenue Northeast at Northeast 185th Street. So in addition to individual projects listed in the TIP, there are multiple capital programs that are also identified and, con and are continually funded, which have, uh, which have added specific projects. Uh, some of those programs include such as the, North, uh, the Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program, the Bike Program, Sidewalk Walkway Program, to name a couple of them. Uh, this year's TIP additions include for the Pavement Preservation Program, uh, Juanita Woodenville Way Northeast Overlay from Northeast 160th Street to 121st Avenue, the East Riverside Drive Overlay from I-405 to 11th Avenue, uh, 240th Street Southeast Overlay from 4th Avenue to Bothell Way, and also added were sidewalk walkway projects including 224th Street Southwest Sidewalk Improvements from Frank Love Elementary to Meridian. Avenue and uh, the Fifth Avenue sidewalk improvements from 240th Street to Shelton View Elementary School uh, and 124th Avenue Northeast sidewalk improvements Northeast 164th Street to Northeast 169th Street. Following tonight's study session, uh, staff will be preparing for a public hearing next Tuesday, June 13th and then finalize the resolution and the TIP for adoption at the June 27th meeting. Uh, once the resolution is adopted, staff will submit the TIP to the State Department of Transportation. Uh, that completes our presentation. We welcome any feedback or questions you have at this time. I have a whole bunch of questions tabbed, so when you all get tired of, you know, just interrupt me. Um, uh, I think what it probably impressed me was as I was going through a lot of things to thank you 
attention, um, things that you look for that we weren't looking for, things that you included that we were looking for. Um, it just, it, it, I don't want to say it means a lot to me personally, but knowing that you're giving thought to taking care of Bothell comprehensively, north to south, it means a lot, and it means a lot to the people of Bothell. So thank you for that. Uh, East Riverside Drive, I know um, there was concern because it has so many constraints about what we can do, but anything that we're doing, I don't know if the overlay is going to allow for markings that will make it safer for bike travel, or if we're going to try to move all that bike travel over to the trail. I don't know what you have planned, but I know it's in good hands. So. I appreciate that. Um, and then having substituted at Shelton View Elementary School a lot and seeing the traffic there, knowing that you're giving attention to those kids and families, that that um, is very much appreciated. Uh, let me try to just not hog up the floor too much. Um, I anticipate as the work goes on on 527 from Reader Way up to what is it, two? 40th, you'll update us because I know we're all excited with the amount of money and planning that we can go in that. So anytime you want to toot your horn, we want to we want to hear it. Um, and then uh, uh, the collector corridor safety program. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? So that's a specific program that we allocate a certain amount of read to funds um, for safety along um, collectors, which is a classification, the lowest classification of arterials. So it's just a designation to specifically reserve funds for that type of street. So as an example, <laughs> interestingly enough, coming up, I think on 19th, if you go north of the park, there's kind of like a little... Um, vertical curve, which a line of sight issue, and right. some of the neighbors, when they try to take a left turn out, it gets a little bit concerning to them because cars are going too fast. Right. But when they come over the hill, they can't quite see. So we're trying to purchase some equipment for our um, speed radar there, basically a flashing sign, which tends to alert people like me if I'm driving too fast in my neighborhood, you see your speed, you go, oh, I gotta slow down. Right. So that's the kind of thing that that program does. It's, okay. It looks for safety issues and it's a pot of funds that we can use to address issues you like that. You might have different tools that you bring out of your tool yep. chest for it. Okay, great. Um, and then, uh, the Sidewalk or the access to improvements on, uh, I think it's tip 18 on um, 102nd Avenue. Is that ST going to be contributing to that funding a, a lot on that? Is that 102nd Avenue access? Right. Yeah. Right. So okay. we're almost completed design on that one. Um, Sound Transit is funding most of the money. Okay. We're a little short. So this summer we're going to probably apply for a TAP grant. Transportation Alternative um, Program okay. to try to get the balance of the funding so we can go out. A grant, not a loan. A grant, yes. Yes, that, that's great. Um, and then I saw rectangular rapid flashing beacons at school crossings, which is great. The 102nd a Avenue bridge replacement, is there a time frame that we're thinking about for that? So I'm a structural engineer. So I'm keeping pushing that to not to keep it on our radar. It is a longer term toward okay. the end of the six year cycle. Um, it does take a lot to collect the different pots of funds to fund the bridge project. And it's there. Well. I mean, it's you have it down here written down so that yes. we get. So, so this summer, last summer, uh, one of our engineers applied for uh, one of the um, federal grants for bridges for planning purposes. So we will try again. We debriefed with the federal government, and we there's a few questions we probably could have answered a little better, so we're hopeful that we can compete better. Okay. And what it would do would be to fund a type, size, and location study for the bridge. And that's very important because that determines where the bridge is going to go, how you're going to build the bridge while you still use the bridge if you have to. <clears throat> and then... For us, very important is how much it's going to cost. And what that does is give us some assurity of the type of money we need to look for for grants. 
Okay. So if we're successful with that, then we'll proceed. We do have a little pot of money in our bridge program to start that anyway, but it would be great to get further along using a federal grant. So in theory, <clears throat> maybe a 102nd bridge, I can't imagine it moving too far. It can't move too far. I think the action would be how do you get, how do you continue to use it while you rebuild it? And how okay. much does that cost? Therein lies the rub, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I know, I know. Um, and then I saw the uh, rock re-repair on 527, and I looked at where it was. Is that something that can be part of the whole 527 work that we're doing, or, does it, or, or do we, are we going to do the rock re-repair because the road work worth that we have planned for 527 wouldn't touch it, or are the rocks falling down and we need to take care of it now? So the rock repair was actually completed. The only reason we still have it on is because we owe them some um, monitoring and maintenance because it was in the stream corridor. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so we're doing a little work and making sure all the plantings and everything are back. Okay. Yep. How easy is that? The Sorry. rockery you're thinking of, I think, is the one across Safeway. Mm -mm. Okay. So there's another project on there that's called, um, is it, I think it's still on. Rechannelization of 527 Bothell Everett Highway, yeah. and that's kind of a contingency project to restripe that area in case we have to move the traffic away from the east side of the road, which is, goes straight down into Lake Pleasant. Right. Um, that's a big old fill road, and with water coming down it, we're taking care of the water now, but we're watching it, and I guess what we're trying to do is maintain it until we could do the big project and put a nice, solid, sturdy wall and everything there. But in case something happens, a big, great event or whatever, we have a little bit of funds to move the road over so we can continue to use the road without loading the edge of that embankment. Okay, that's, okay. that's uh, good to know. Um, the, main, the main and Festival Street improvements with the bollards is, are we going to be waiting to, for the traffic study? before we decide what we're doing on that or? <clears throat> Sorry, my voice. So we're trying to, with the Main Street Festival Street, we're trying to focus on the infrastructure we need to support events. So that's going forward. And I think very soon we're gonna be going out for public outreach and engage with stakeholders, you know, adjacent businesses, residential people who come down from events. We're gonna ask them what they like about the events, are there any issues getting to the events, access to the events, do they feel safe, and that kind of thing. Um, so that's the public input part. And then we will come back um, and with a design essentially on what we recommend in terms of infrastructure, essentially how we would close the roads when we close them for events. Okay. There's a little bit there also to for um, other appurtenances, like potentially putting in power bollards or maybe a banner pole or something that, again, would assist the events when they happen. Okay. And Council Members Orange, I would point back to you then to the purpose of the of the TIP of like keeping this in there, keeping it, again, we're, we're staying in compliance. There's broader work to be done on each of these specific projects, including that one of right. putting it in context of not just the, the structural, not just the transportation aspect, but what all are we trying to do? Right. So, um, yeah, there's a there's a bigger bigger conversation we have than what you just see okay. listed in this okay. one document. This is just one piece of it. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that reminder and that clarification. That's that's not a small detail. Um, and then, I think um, all, all I can say is the amount of work that you are, that you've identified of taking care of Bothell is sobering, and I'm glad that you're keep, keeping track of it. There's there's a lot of details. No Valhalla this time, Kyle. Uh, the question uh, I have, it's a larger, uh, higher level question, now that I have a year and a half under my belt doing this thing. Um, we have a lot of things to do, and there's always funding issues, and how do you prioritize, and all that. Is there a way we can look at the longer term, where we can, just like you're doing the bridge thing, like we need to figure out, we now identify the bridge as a problem we need to solve. Then it's like, okay, it's a longer term thing that, to identify all the funding. Like for sidewalks, for example, we have a lot of sidewalks that need to get built. And other, 
you know, projects. So can we like think even longer term than six years, even though in this case the bridge is a six year thing, but like even longer term and then start knocking those off as we move forward? I love that question. So on the 27th, we're coming back to talk about the transportation element of the comp plan. And that's what the comp plan will do in terms of transportation. So typically when you talk about the comp plan in the old days, you would talk about vehicular capacity and the projects coming out of there that you could use transportation impact fees. That's what they would go for. <clears throat> but what we're trying to do is go look at different layers like we showed you before. So there would be a bike layer, which we've got a bike plan. We are going to do pedestrian. We were doing outreach. Uh, we had a methodology for pr prioritizing gaps in sidewalks. So we've done a survey. We've gotten input, and we're going to come back and share with you and kind of relook and refresh the prioritization for the PEDs. Vehicles, we're going to probably kind of look in the same way, but we're going to go through a different type of process in how we do things. I mean, in the old days, you go and you identify projects, but what we want to do is go through steps before we get to the projects. The projects are going to be the last thing. So are there programs we can do to get people out of cars? Are there programs we can do to reduce single occupancy vehicle trips? And at the very end, if there are projects that we have to do because there's a certain amount of movement we still need, that's what we will do. So that's the other layer. We can talk about trans transit a little bit. That's typically the realm of three other agencies. Typically, we don't want to spend our money. We don't get to choose where the routes are. We can advocate for that. But there are things we can do to encourage transit. We can get access to the um, transit stops better so that people are, it's easier to use it and safer to use it as well. Um, the last piece would be safety and then resiliency as well. So we have all these different lines of projects, each with their own priorities within their own um, layer. And then we're going to try to come up with an overall prioritization of all those projects across layers. And that will be our 20-year project list. So that is our kind of our longer look. The thing it doesn't really capture as much is more the condition things, kind of like the bridge, other than resiliency and vulnerability to earthquakes and things. So condition is part of the comp plan, you can kind of identify it, but it's also typically different funding as well. So that's the other piece that we have to look at in the longer term. So we are looking at more uh, outcome outcome based, like we want to get more people out of their vehicles, we want more people to walk in this neighborhood, we want more people to take this transit stop, and then we identify the... I think we'll look at it as a system as a whole. Yeah. There will be areas that we will probably focus on, like a little bit about downtown, because we have some questions and a lot of transits coming through Canyon Park, we kind of just looked at. Um, I think one of your priorities was connectivity of neighborhoods and mm. things. I don't think we'll get to that detail in this comp plan, but we can set up policies that basically tell us to address that and implement and look at that. And I think that's something that we're gonna work with community transit over the couple of years after the comp plan to start looking at neighborhoods and connectivity and everything. Because the issue is uh, <clears throat> over, if we identify, he's a pot of money for sidewalks, for example. I know we have the levy and all that, but it's not enough, obviously. So we have a project list that keeps prioritized and reprioritized year over year, but then there's some things that will never get done. Like, can we get through it? You know, that's yeah. the... That's the, yes. the end question. Maybe it's a 40-year question, not a 20-year question. I don't know. And I think that's going to be a hard part about the comp plan. It's called the constrained project list or constrained program list. And I want to make sure it's clear. It's not going to just be projects. We're going to have to spend money on programs to get people out of cars, like TDM programs, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which will ultimately save us money and not spending a lot of one-time money on capital projects mm -hmm. as well. Um, but we will have to come up with a 20-year list, and it's not easy because mm. you have to prioritize because there, there isn't enough money. Mm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm really excited to see that comp plan part come back that you talked about. That sounds super interesting, and I cannot wait. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, on the TIP, I saw obviously the bike plan was listed and not on the map, but does that mean that all the projects in the bike plan are included in the TIP and eligible for grant funding, all that? Cool. Um, and um, you answered Council Member Zorn's question about the collector corridor safety program. You used radar as an example. Are physical traffic calming elements eligible for that pot of money also? 
Yeah, there's two pots, I think. We have um, card. The collectors are for the arterials specifically, yeah. collectors. But we have a neighborhood traffic calming program that I think we just started putting money back in again. Those are more for the neighborhoods and local streets. Cool. Awesome. That's all I've got. Okay, I got the hint. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I really appreciate it and I appreciate seeing, you know, all the work that um, everyone has worked on and like the bike plan and the capital facilities plan show up here and, and I don't have any questions because as usual you all ask my questions. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much everybody. Uh, that's the great, great feedback and great questions. So we will see you back uh, for a public hearing on this on next week. Next Perfect. Tuesday. Excited. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It is. Uh, we're going to take a ten minute break right now. It is nine oh one. We are going to come back at nine eleven. Can you do it in nine minutes? Nine eleven. It works. Yeah. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, our last study session tonight is Agenda Bill 23087, the Fire Regionalization Work Plan Update. Kick it over to you, Kyle. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And just as uh, a bit of background for Council, there's a couple things. One is sometimes with study sessions, we're coming back like the next week for a decision. So it really is an opportunity we're just trying to bifurcate learning and deciding. In this case, uh, there's a little more of a timeline involved, and so we'll, we'll cover that tonight. But this is, just want to emphasize up front that this is not an imminent decision in front of the council. What we're really looking tonight is to, um, to follow up on a conversation that happened, gosh, in the first quarter of last year, where council did hear about some options around um, fire service and express some interest in, in learning more, but at a later time. Um, so as I've discussed with uh, each of you uh, over the past few months is that with adding, um, bringing in a deputy city manager when I was thinking about what was the initial work plan that we'd be assigning them, one of the things that was high on my list was to complete that work and to really to be leading that out of the, the executive office, um, making sure that, again, I think we, we can't do this without partnership with, with FIRE, but wanting to make sure that we're looking at it. It's a, an important one to council. It's an important one to me, and so let's keep that um, that perspective. And um, so that's something that Tony came in on day one uh, being focused on. And then, um, you know, I think also highlighted with the transition of leadership in the fire department, as I explained when we brought in interim chief Ryzen, that uh, really answering the question of what do does the future of fire look like was an important one to answer. Um, because if the if if we're thinking long term in Bothell, then we want to go out and recruit a chief. If we're thinking that maybe that's uh, interesting to look at other options, or there might be it'd be worthy of looking at other options, I would hate to go out with a recruitment and then tell the person, "Hey, guess what?" So um, I think this is uh, we've got the right team in front of us. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to to Tony Call or to lead off the presentation. Oh, all right. I think we satisfied the need, so I'm going to go straight to the fire chief. Thank you, Chief Risen. Thank you very much, and thank you to council for your attention tonight. I know it's a long meeting. Um, our goal tonight is to seek feedback from you and some direction to move forward with a work plan that we're going to explain to you to evaluate and recommend a fire service model, including an option that may be regionalization, and we'll talk about that work plan as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is um, provide a little bit of a background on very shallow on what the fire department does just to refresh your memory, kind of an operational overview. And then we're going to talk, uh, Tony's mostly going to talk about the work plan and how we proceed to take on this body of work to include the direction that uh, you may provide. Uh, one of the things you're going to hear over and over, um, if not tonight, but throughout this process, is that myself, T 
Tony, I think the city manager, I can speak for him. We have no preconceived outcome. Uh, we are going to look at all options and come back to council with recommendations that we think would be to, for the benefit of the city and the fire department. So that's our goal. The uh, mission statement for the fire department is uh, about safeguarding the lives, property, environment of our community through exceptional service and education, preparedness, prevention, response to emergency incidents. Um, in my short time here, I can report to the council that um, I've been very impressed with the staff, um, whether they're in fire administration, fire prevention, operations, on their absolute commitment to this statement. And um, you should be very proud as a council of the organization that you've helped put together. Um, I look at the organization today, and I think I kind of look at it as a benchmark that we certainly wouldn't want to go below with any proposal that we would bring back to council. So I think um, no declination of service is on my agenda. So I think that's important to point out. Um, looking at the fire department and how we function, um, we can go to the next, there you go. Where'd it go? There, it goes. there it is. This is, um, this is our data from 2022. Um, we have three stations, we still do in 2024 or three, whatever year it is. Um, we have 12 people on duty every day out of those three stations. Um, we answered a call volume of 7,240 calls, 88% uh, of, or I'm gonna say about 77% of those were emergency medical service responses. Um, and if you can look at <clears throat> the average response time um, is nine minutes and 17 seconds. Um, I wanna start looking at that a little closer and seeing if there's ways to improve that. Um, with the existing resources we have. Um, if you look at the incident growth over the last uh, eight to nine, 10 years, uh, you can see it's escalating as the city grows and evolves. It seems EMS post 2020 is actually rising at a much steeper slope. The dip? The, the, not the dip, the post the dip. It's growing, riser, uh, rising at a steeper slope than prior to the pandemic. After the pandemic, we're actually having yeah, the more, dip, more incidents than before, the rate. Yeah, I, I haven't done a deep dive into this data um, as to the whys, but um, the dip is obviously COVID, where more people were home, businesses were closed. Um, but uh, we can see we're starting to creep back up there. Um, the big question is why should we consider alternative options? And, um, you know, as we see the growth of the city and the growth of call volume, uh, we're seeing our city evolve. And as the fire chief, I think, you know, as we need to evolve with the city and grow with the city as it to meet the service demands. Um, the city is not only getting uh, busier, but the incidents you'll see as the city grows are going to be more complex where you have buildings that are you know these apartment buildings that are just huge and tracking down a smoke detector going off in those takes a while so um, they're a little bit more complex as the fire chief i constantly challenge the organization of are we doing things the way we're doing them because it's the best way or because we just found it that way. Um, and that's kind of a, to me, a general tenet of leadership is to challenge the organization that way. And this is, in a essence, a continuation of that is we're looking at the whole organization saying, are we doing the best job for our citizens in our current situation? And, and if not, let's look at the options to what they are. Um, as the community grows, your costs are going to increase over time. Uh, and do we want to share those costs with 
a bigger jurisdiction, a bigger population, or just a smaller bothell population. So um, one of the options that we will look at is remaining as we are. Um, as I said before, we have no preconceived outcome. Um, one of the things about consolidating or merging or contracting is we can be a little bit more efficient. You're going to spend a given amount of money on fire protection. And what I would say is if a, you're looking at a bigger organization, you can maybe say that that money is being spent with better effect than a smaller organization. And that's something that we have to look at and um, leverage to see if we can prove that to you, if that's one of our options. Um, we can also tend to be more strategic um, rather than adding resources. A, a larger organization might just be able to relocate, say, a ladder company to improve service in one part of their jurisdiction versus a smaller jurisdiction would just have to add the ladder company. So it's things like that that we can look at for efficiency. The other part is um, smaller fire departments are becoming an endangered species. Um, as we're speaking here tonight, Mercer Island City Council is having the same debate and looking over proposals from both Bellevue and Eastside Fire on what they should do with their fire department. Uh, Tequila has done the same thing. Woodenville just recently contracted with Eastside. Uh, North Shore, we saw, went with uh, Shoreline. And so I think uh, potentially we could be the last smaller city in King County to uh, operate under this smaller department model. So um, those are the reasons why I think we need to look at this and look at all of the facts and bring those back to you. And Tony's going to talk about how we're going to do that. Thanks, Chief Rice. Nice job, Mayor and Deputy Mayor and, and Council. It's good to be back. Um, I'll have a couple of slides on kind of what our work is going to look like over the next bit um, and give you a timeline towards the end. So our work plan objective is that we are here to evaluate and recommend a fire service model. That includes all operations for training, administration, response, including the support structure. So it takes a lot of support structures that may not be in the fire department to help operate the fire department. You've got finance folks, you've got HR folks, human resource folks, you have fleet, et cetera. So we're looking at an all-inclusive, holistic look to what is a, a good service model to recommend to you. So that's our first kind of objective. The second item that I bring to you is kind of what is our scope. So as we think about uh, looking at a service model, uh, we are looking at all options currently under the Revised Code of Washington or the RCW. It includes anything from annexing into an existing fire district, creating a regional fire service, or excuse me, a regional fire authority, contracting for services. Maybe the answer is that we should be a fire district that's encompassing our current existing service level, or our service area, excuse me. And then, of course, status quo. Maybe the right answer is to remain as the Bothell Fire Department. As Chief Risen said, we don't have a preconceived idea. And we also know that Bothell Fire has done an outstanding job providing service to this community. So we will be hiring um, experts who have done fire service modeling work before. And there might be something else that's in the Revised Code of Washington that's not on this list, which is why you see the any other option that comes up with, because you never know. They could bring out and say, well, there's another thing we could think about out there. So we're trying to cast the wide net, excuse me, cast a, a, a wide net so that we can look at all options. As we, oh, thank you. As we think about, because uh, you know, we've talked about you know, what our objective is, what's our scope. So what are those guideposts or those critical themes or guiding principles or core principles, take your word, 
what's important as we come back, right? So some of the things that staff is holding dear is first, any service model needs to maintain or improve service. We would look at that by actually looking at metrics. Um, the fire department has many metrics, as you saw earlier. We would use those plus others. Um, the second one on the list is that we're going to respect our employees. So uh, the men and women who currently serve or support the fire service are outstanding employees. And our goal is to continue to respect them and that any uh, service provider uh, would still provide the greatest support, training, and professional development opportunities for our teammates. So that's a very important piece. We'll be seeking stakeholder input. So not only from our own stakeholders, maybe that are internal, but also from the community. Um, what that exactly looks like, I don't have an exact answer for, but I do know that it's going to be very important that we collect feedback as we embark on this project. The fourth item down being economically sensible. I'm just going to throw it right out there. To me, it does not mean we're looking for the cheapest service. That's not kind of where we're at. I think what we're looking is what is the right value for the dollar and does it make economic sense. So if we're getting a higher level of service and it costs a little more, maybe that makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. But that's kind of the look that we'll be looking for. And then, of course, a guidepost has got to be we're going to be transparent. Um, depending on your feedback tonight, Chief Ryzen and I are going to work together and get a website up and running if you ask us to continue in this body of work because we want to be transparent to the public and to um, all of our employees. So when you think about what our objective is, what our scope is, what our guideposts are, so what is the analysis that we'll be bringing back? What are some of the key areas of analysis that are needed in order to make a recommendation on a fire service model? So this is a collection, and you'll see at the bottom, of course, there's any other area that we haven't thought of yet, but the first being taxation. Right? So does the taxation rate change? I don't know, but it's something we should be looking at. What is the cost of service compared to what we pay now? Who has the authority to implement? Right? Is it a vote of this body, the city council, or does it require a public vote in which you have to put something out to the public? And which public? We live in two counties. How does all of that work? So I think the analysis has to encompass that decision making as well. Local identity and local control. We know the fire department's incredibly important to Bothell. I, I know that because I'm going to go to the pancake breakfast on the 4th of July because I'm getting pancakes. Um, so I, I know it's important. So how do we think about local control and local identity and what options exist for that? Obviously, we've talked about service level. We've talked about that a little bit earlier. Personnel, we have many people, and it's really important that we think about the impacts to personnel. And then we have contractual obligations, everything from the levy work, um, or excuse me, the levy that passed not long ago to fire station buildings, to apparatus, to maintenance, to et cetera. So all those contractual obligations need to be looked at. So this is not a little body of work. This isn't going to, as the city manager standard mentioned, this isn't going to come back to you in two or three weeks. We're looking at several months of work to be able to think about how do we look at all of this and bring back kind of an next set of recommendations to you. So thinking about our timeline, uh, kind of where we are today is, I'm calling this early summer 2023. We're here to say, do you want us to continue to move forward with this work plan and this approach and this work? Over the summer and into the fall, we'll be doing that objective analysis, doing stakeholder outreach, doing public outreach, doing a variety of things to connect and get our analysis work done. Coming back to you probably late fall, early winter with what did we find and what are our next steps and report out to you. I can't tell you what that's going to be because we haven't done the work yet. So I can tell you that we'll come back with recommendations and next steps when we know more about what we're talking about. But as we've said, this is really an objective look, no preconceived, no preconceived answers, and um, we currently have a good fire department. So I think it's really important that we remember the service that gets delivered every day in this community. All right. So with that, we are looking for feedback and direction to move forward with a work plan to evaluate recommending a fire service model. And one of those things will include an option for regionalization. And again, it is the beginning of work. It, we're not asking for an outcome today. We are asking for permission to continue to move forward. So with that, uh, Mayor or whomever, I turn it back to you. 30 session. Go ahead. <clears throat> jump in. Uh, thank you for this presentation. <clears throat> there is a uh, 
You mentioned it, Tony, at the end, and mm -hmm. the chief mentioned it before. We have a great fire department. I mean, we. So my first question is like, why now? Why go through this now? What is causing the initiation of this work? I think do you want to take that, or do you want to? Go ahead. I can. Right. I I think um, with uh, Bruce Chief Cruen retiring, and then faced with the challenge of how do we fill that position, it's very hard to go out and recruit a fire chief and then say, we would like you to eliminate your job as soon as you possibly can. And so uh, that is led to my interim mm -hmm. assignment. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we come back to we stay Bothell Fire Department, then we can go and look at that. Uh, so based on uh, some work that was done previously under Chief Kroon, coupled with his departure, um, it, the timing I think seemed right to the city manager to do this work now. I would add a little bit more on to that and say Bothell is a very much of a growing community. I, I've been employed here for now just, just shy of six months or close to six months. And I have learned a tremendous amount about Bothell. But it is a growing community. And thinking about the future and ensuring that whatever service it is, it's the right service for the future, I think this is that opportune time to think about it. When was the last time we did such an analysis, or if ever? You've done several pieces of analysis over the last several years. You did some work back in 2013, some work in 2015, and then last year, about this time, or it might have been a little bit earlier than this time, was, I'm guessing on the timeline, you had a presentation. It, it wasn't like this. Though. It was it, not an all-inclusive, so uh, yeah. um, broad scope, um, uh, asking, saying, let's do an objective look at it, and let's put it to bed one way or the other at this point. Mr. Stanton, did you have something you wanted to say? I was just going to, I think that that is one of the things that we've committed to, and I think you heard today of what makes this different too, is that we, there are um, going to always be ideas, thoughts, and opinions of what the top alternative that we should be comparing to is. I think in all of the conversations, obviously, since we are still Bothell Fire, there's always been that that's been one of the options, but I think there's been some more targeted analysis on one or two things, and um, one of the one of the challenges that I gave to the deputy city manager was let's look at this holistically because I think for for the organization for the community it helps to take a look and say we've considered all options and this is what the best approach appears to be as opposed to having to answer this question again three years from now. So trying to kind of break that cycle of breaking back pieces of it and let's go ahead and look comprehensively and chart the course for future. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool. I know we got, when we first, uh, when I first started on the council last year, I was like new, it was like, I barely knew how to navigate the halls here. It's like, and it's like, here's a bunch of information. It's like, I don't know what the heck is going on here. So I'm glad that this is, uh, this is happening. So thank you. A uh, couple of uh, things on your, uh, just the consideration element slide, uh, nothing major. I'm sure you will, you'll do it. Is the timeline to implement the recommendation and, uh, the impact of current service while we're implementing the recommendation, assuming we change, you know, if it's yeah. status quo, then nothing happens. But I will put both of those things on the list. That's good feedback. I'll make sure they get on as we come back to you. Um, after our analysis is done, we'll come back and, and look at what it would take to make that implementation. So we'll make sure we put those on the list as well. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to jump in because I can. Um, I guess the thing that I would really like to know is like as we as we talk through our fire department and we talk about our fire department there doesn't seem to be a lot of problems that we need to solve for so like you know as we you know with limited staff resources talk about embarking on something that's pretty big like this is a this is a big lift I guess the question that I would ask above and beyond just like the city manager said like trying to make sure like we're doing everything just right like what what problem do we have that we are that we can justify spending this much time and effort on? I'll take a stab at that. Or do you want to take sure. a stab? Go for it. All right. Well, I'd leave it up to you. All right. Um, I, I don't know that we have, quote unquote, a problem. I think it's really important to note that the city of Bothell Fire Department has done an outstanding job serving this community. There's no doubt in my mind. I think it goes back to the concept of the future mm -hmm. and how do we think about the future and the growth that the city is facing. And how do we ensure that we're preparing for that future? So it is a problem today? No, I don't believe that to be true. Is it something we should be thinking about as we would do any kind of check and adjust of service? 
it's something we should be thinking about. Um, so I, I believe that would be better answered. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, I, I'll go back to my statement that I think uh, it's the job of leadership to ask the question, are we doing what we're doing because it's the best or because we found it that way? And, and part of that answering that question is doing analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's basically all we're asking to do is to look at that analysis. If, uh, if you've been around here a little longer, you would know how much that was music to my ears because uh, inertia is incredibly powerful and we do things a lot of the times just because that's the way we do things. Um, um, as, we, as we talk about the long term, I just want to make sure that like, that's really the main thing I care about. Like, I don't care as much about what the short term ramifications of this are and I care far more about the city we're leaving to our kids and what Bothell is going to look like with them. You know, I, I hesitate with some of the different options because we lose uh, control over what we can do with things. And to me, that looks like long-term risk when we don't have that. Mm -hmm. And I don't really want to exchange a short-term benefit for a long-term risk or a risk, a risk of harm. Um, like, I don't want a Band-Aid yeah. for a problem we don't have because it doesn't seem like there's a real big problem. Um, you've mentioned growth a few times and pressures around that, um, but also it seems like it's the smaller cities that have trouble making fire service feasible. So like, is there anything about a growing city that makes it more difficult to provide fire service? I think that's definitely a fire chief question. <clears throat> yes. Um, we talked, I, I mentioned a little bit about um, things like population density, uh, multi it, growth of population, you go from a small strip mall type environment to larger apartment buildings, things like that. All of those contribute um, and what you start having is uh, multiple calls for service at the same time. Mm -hmm. We're, and I think, I haven't done the analysis yet, but I think part of our response time issue is units being out of service and other units having to cross the city to mm -hmm. cover, which gives you a very long response time, which if, if we were, if I was going to define our business, it's response time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's responding to a house fire or a heart attack, we want to get there quick. And so I want to do everything I can to reduce that. And so <clears throat> you start looking at that. And um, in my old job, I always told the city manager that you're building me a, an urban city and I still have a suburban fire department. And that helped him understand and helped the fire department understand that there's not, not only a, a service level increase that needs to happen, but there is a, a mindset increase that needs to happen uh, where we're trying to solve more urban problems with suburban solutions. And it was more pronounced in my old job, but I'm seeing the same things here where bigger buildings, people living in bigger buildings instead of just being office space or something where everybody goes home at night and all of those things contribute. So when we talk about an urban versus a suburban fire department, like that seems to me like, hey, like no matter how we do this, like we should start planning for the future that we know is coming. Like what are some of the differences? Like what, what would it look like to build a more urban fire department as compared to a suburban one? Well, I think what, um, I don't think you have, you're not there yet, you know, so I want to be clear about that, that you're not on the precipice of having to spend a ton of money. But I think eventually someday the Survey and Rating Bureau is going to come to your town and they're going to look at your downtown core and the ladder truck that you have, what we call cross staff now where your sh the engine staffs both rigs, they're going to say you need to stop to staff that or we're going to reduce your fire insurance rating. That's the type of issues you run into. Um, but also it's like their training needs also go up, which means more units are out of service, more for training. Um, so you got to figure out how do we cover for units out of service so we don't make that response time keep creeping up. Um, 
And then uh, I think there's a training mindset among the employees that you need to um, to start getting them to think that you're not in a small town anymore. You're mm -hmm. starting to see more complex fire problems, so you need more bigger uh, mindset as far as how you respond and react to those situations. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the way this has been presented to us in the past is that cost savings is the biggest benefit by far. Um, and all of those cost savings are around administration. Um, like we, we don't want fewer firefighters. Um, is there a way we can just contract for administration? We certainly can put it on the list of things to, to, to look at, absolutely. Okay. I, I think at this moment, where at least where I sit at, and Amanda does have her hand raised, by the way, sir, um, just so that you know. Um, uh, um, I think where I said, as I mentioned earlier, I, I don't think we're looking for the least cost. We're looking for the right value for the dollar for the service. It's really important that we think in a kind of a different mindset. I, I don't know what we'll find, but I think serving the community has got to be top, top notch. Okay, really I got one important. more question, and then, okay. then, then I'll shut up. Um, okay. I guess this is a big lift, and my big nervousness around this is the opportunity cost of what else we might not do because we're doing this. So I guess help me feel better about that. City manager hired me. I'm, I'll start, <laughs> sir, and then I'll let you pitch in. <laughs> sir, uh, the city manager hired me, and on day one he came in and said, this is something we should be looking at. And so I think we're well set up and prepared. We, the opportunity cost, I don't think it's as much as the time of staff that you think, because we will be hiring some experts to come in that are well versed. So it's not like they're starting work from zero ground. They're starting from work way up here, and I think we're running to catch up versus vice versa. So I, I don't think it's as large of a staff lift. I think what it's really about is what, what Mark has said. It's really about the leadership level. And that's being able to communicate with our teammates, the people who we work with every day, and providing them a safe place. I think that's, the, that's really important. Um, and before I turn it over to Kyle, I want to make sure I, I mention to you, I did get on my considerations list the concept between short-term risk and long-term risk. So I did get that in the list here. I want to make sure that you knew that I heard that. Um, so Thank I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Standard. Not everybody is, is equipped to basically say, I'm here to do this job. So that was, yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to try and give Tony some cover to have to talk, to not talk about herself. But I think the other thing that I would just mention on this is that um, from the standpoint of about staff capacity, I think there's the other part that comes into the guideposts that, that Tony talked about is that there's this value of the commitment to the teammates that we currently have too, and not only just within the fire department, and I don't want to say just to make that sound smaller, but that's the obvious place that we're going to look. But there are a number of um, staff in the organization who support fire and enjoy that part of their job. There's an identity to local government of the things that we do. And I think back to my recruitment even, we talk about the types of services that Bothell provides, and fire is certainly one of them. So there's a there's a pride of that. And so one of the things that, that we're having dedicated resource in terms of the deputy and having this on that work plan is also for that communication to our organization and to the community to make sure that where the transparency value is taken care of. So we've we've calculated that in from, again, as we start this work plan of thinking about how are we going to um, how are we going to leverage the deputy position, how are we going to leverage the assistant city manager position, and how are we going to work together across the organization. So we're definitely thinking through that. And I just wanted to highlight that one more time, too, is not only the anticipation of it, but that we're not, um, we're not trying to go fast, necessarily. We are trying to be thorough and um, and and open with people so that we're all going along together. Perfect. I do remember being told that uh, the fact that we're a full service city made the city manager job more attractive too. So, <laughs> For, so I can ask a question. So. Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to shut up now. Can I sneak in? Yes, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Um, so I I did want to before I forget because um, I have a couple of questions. But um, Chief Ryzen, you mentioned um, one of the things you suspected about our level of service is when a unit is on a call and another call comes in, a unit has to come from across the city to to answer that call. And I'm curious with regionalization, 
would we then not have more units also further away because we're part of a larger regional authority? I'm curious how that how that problem is is helped by regionalization. I think if you look at a regional solution, you're you're going to be able to look at that. Um, right now, we have to look at that problem and solve within the resources of Bothell. And I think if you go to a more regional solution, you can um, look at a more str bigger strategic solution that might work. Um, you're always going to have those occurrences. We can't be there every time. But if you start to lower them, that response overall response time goes down. And if you do have to add more resources, um, it's coming from a larger population, so the cost per capita to pay for that resource might be a little bit lower. Does that answer your question, question Councilman? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think when we talk about the cost, so we had a really helpful um, letter today um, from Pat Pierce, and I appreciated that, and, and I, I've been kind of, as we prepared to talk about this, I've been talking to um, other elected officials, former elected officials, um, people retired from various fire services. And one of the interesting things is, is there's sometimes a promise of less cost and it's not, it doesn't seem like it's always realized. So I really, when we study the, the cost, cause it's not about how much does it cost, but we're obviously gonna pay attention to that. I would like to see how did the cost shape up over five years, 10 years? We have a lot of examples around us that have taken on some of this work and some of the solutions we're looking at. And I really want an honest evaluation of how long did they see cost savings? Were the costs that were, obviously you can't promise a certain cost, but I wanna know like 10 years on, 20 years on, if we have a 20 year example, are taxpayers paying more or less for fire service? And what is the level of service that they're getting in comparison? And then I would also, really want to compare and benchmark how the level of service that we get from Bothell Fire um, compared to the different entities that we might choose to join um, and really understand that. And then, of course, what the what the tax rates are, because I really just I feel like we need so much data. So I'm, if this is already in your plan, I, I appreciate it. I'm just it, it's a lot to look at. Um, and the other consideration that's a little the little hard to define, but some of the folks that have been on um, boards and um, sort of like studied this for for different local municipalities have shared that that the the discourse can get a little feisty at times. So I really am curious how we can have this discussion without having um, having it get kind of you know um, where people have a, a thing that they want and they are very firm about it. And I think that having opinions is, is great, but I just want us to remember that we're talking about people, we're talking about serving our community, we're talking about some of the most, you know, people who are showing up in some of the most traumatic events of someone's lives. So I really don't want to invite um, bad discourse into Bothell because we're we're not that far from it otherwise politically. And it just, it makes me nervous thinking about how sometimes people take opportunities to not present their best selves in these discussions. So however we can we can address that would be great. Uh, Councilmember, I'll weigh in really quickly um, to the last point. Uh, I think one of our guideposts is that we're going to be transparent and honest and uh, 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 working with our employees inside the organization and with the community. So I think the best we can do is to be our best selves. And if we are really coming at this with a holistic look, then whatever the right answer is will eventually bubble to the top. And um, it, that would be our goal, is that it's objective and transparent. Anything you'd like to add to that, Mr. Perfectly okay. said. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. And, I, and I've never met any Bothell Fire Department um, firefighter or employee who has never just impressed me and been so kind. So I'm looking forward to, to just learning more and hearing more about this. Thank you. I'm going to jump in here. Um, uh, some of you, I, you have heard me talk about this. When my husband was on council in the early 90s, Bothell moved back to owning the fire department and became, uh, I forget if we were a district or what we were, but it became very important uh, that Bothell uh, come back and have control for their fire department. 
Um, Bothell's changed a little bit since the 90s. Um, but in my mind, in the time, in the flow of time, we haven't had our fire department that long. We've had our own fire department for a shorter time than we've been a city. So, um, at any rate, and, and Sandy Gwynn, you probably, because you used to watch city council, I don't know who all remembers Sandy Gwynn, but um, six years ago when I first ran, and she's, she was in, in stages of cancer, and she was fighting regionalization so much. I mean, she was showing up all, at all those meetings with her concerns. And when she was passing away from cancer, I said, what do you need me to do? And she said, do not regionalize. And so, <laughs> and so I said, I promise, no regionalization. That promise was good for my first term. And her concerns about regionalization, we've talked about, you know, what happens to the taxes for the community who are paying for fire. And, you know, you've laid that saying that goes back to state law requires that to go back and, and be, um, uh, I don't know if refunded is, or re, not computed into their taxes. And it'll be replaced with, a more diverse um, taxation, but um, I, I do want to nod that I uh, make a nod to Sandy that I had promised her, and 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 I am watching for her questions. Uh, I appreciate you talking about uh, um, making sure that we have service. I guess I, when you're talking about guaranteeing service as we grow, I was thinking. Outside of Bothell, we have along our transit corridors lots of development. And so at what point do we lose? That's a question I'll be asking you when you come up with plans of, um, are we going to lose that response time because now fire, you know, our fire and EMT who are being called to us site are now having to go service another area that they would, didn't service in the past. And now we have a chunk of bottle that's vulnerable and has no one to, you know, be there as quickly as if the fires of our firefighters were as they were. Um, and you made a good point as, as we grow more services needed, it's not just fire. We're going to have police. We're going to have all kinds of services that are going to be, it's a good reality check. Then another question that I'll be uh, looking for is training. Right now, our our firefighters get excellent training. They've got a you know they've created a great program for training. So how is training going to be impacted with the different plans? And uh, I appreciate one of your points is including our firefighters and EMT in the conversation. Um, their boots on the ground, they know. Uh, so thank you for doing that. And then this is just a, tr just a curiosity question. Volunteer firefighter. Is that working? Is that strictly for, thank you. Is that strictly for smaller communities that there's volunteer firefighters? I mean, what are the, di you know, tell me about this mystery group of of um, um, of firefighters that you know. I I think there's very few fire volunteer firefighters left um, in the urban areas of King County or Snohomish County. You might find them out in the more rural areas. Um, my response to your question would be the training requirements for firefighters now are compared to when I was hired are huge and um, a volunteer can't do that yeah trying to find people in the community that are going to commit that kind of time and you know and if you look at our call volume respond to calls on top of that mm -hmm. I just don't think it's a practical and solution. are not retirees they're able they're able bodied yeah you, you <laughs> would like people that could do heavy work right so. <laughs> right okay thank you but thank you for the, your comprehensive look I just uh, uh, I think uh, council member Dodd had a good question is for the 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 groups like the city of Woodenville 
what's happened to their response time since they have moved into work becoming more regional, which I'm sure you'll do, but I appreciated her bringing that out. I'll jump in. My, mine will be short. Uh, I think I gave most of my feedback during the public safety committee meeting. Um, I'll just say that I'm I classify myself as nervously interested. I think this is good research to do. It's good to understand what the options are. You know, is as you mentioned, is this model the best model for our growing city and where we're going to the future? Um, I do have just personal concerns about regionalization. Means you get more resources potentially but you also may be subsidizing other areas and have less control over those resources. So there's a trade-off there. Um, I'm interested to hear again what you, what you learn um, from this process. And I know there's many ways to do these things, just from what I've heard from firefighters, there's, you know, do you lease your stations? Do the stations go in the process? All those things are gonna have to be figured out. I don't envy you for having to try to map all that out for us. Um, it's a lot of work and there's a lot of considerations there and having watched the previous two regionalization discussions i think those historically were done because there was an opportunity there with others that were thinking about it this i'm excited about because it's just bothell we're looking at and considering just what's best for our residents and we're looking at all the options not just what others other cities are looking at as well so um I'm glad we're finally doing this. I think it's gonna be a good outcome regardless of what we find from the study. Um, I love our city department. We've gotten emails from people who love the city department, past council members have loved the department. Um, so regardless of where we go, um, the people, I'm glad the people are one of the tenants and um, we're gonna get excellent service no matter what we do. So thank you for carrying on this body of work. And I know it's, uh, it's a pretty heavy lift, so thank you. God, I don't know how to follow that. Um, I, I would just say that um, I have a couple comments I want to make, but um, single-handedly public safety, probably the single most important thing we can do is offer that level of service to our community and ensure that we look at it holistically to ensure that we do not diminish our level of service, but if anything, increase our level of service. Um, people are counting on us um, to make right decisions um, to ensure life and safety. So um, a couple of uh, things that, that I had questions on were and comments were around um, joint counties, um, service levels and making sure that, you know, we're, we're able to, as we're looking at this, look at holistically King and Snohomish together um, and understanding the dynamics of districts versus regionalization and how that plays out when you cross county lines, et cetera. You brought up the point of um, talking about response, joint responses to some degree, and how does that work um, currently with joint response? So as an example, if we're out on a call um, in Snohomish County and we have nobody that can respond to that, does Snohomish County help respond to that? So kind of making sure that we look at that as well, I think is important. Yeah, um, Snohomish County and King County units are dispatched from two different dispatch centers. Um, so all of our vehicles um, have what we call AVL, automatic vehicle locators. For example, um, an engine company from say station 44 up on 228, they're driving through downtown returning from training, but they're available if a call comes in three blocks away, the computer picks up their location and sends them immediately. And even if they were coming back from a call in, or a, a training in Kirkland, and they were in downtown Kirkland, they would still get picked up and sent on that call if they were available. So I think an unsung story is what the work we've done to date of ensuring we have a borderless response through the King County Fire Chiefs. Um, Snohomish County, if we need Snohomish County units, we've got to call them and then they've got to be dispatched. So there's a bit of a, maybe a minute delay there. Hmm. So that brings up dispatch as an opportunity then as well, potentially. Um, 
potentially. I think that that the dispatch question is better solved with technology, mm -hmm. where the dispatch centers um, can talk to each other and know where each other's units are, and communicate. Um, from a minute down to milliseconds of what units are needed. I think that would be a easier solution than trying to merge dispatch centers just off the top of my head. So would that be an administration thing or? That would be a NORCOM and SNOCOM thing. So I think we'll probably be having conversations about that. Potentially. Sometime soon. Okay. Um, understanding um, urban, large cities, suburban cities. So as an example, what constitutes a, a, a smaller city becoming larger, having their own department, and then regionalizing. So as an example, what is a large city around here that has its own fire department that's 80,000, 60,000? Yeah, I think you could look at Kirkland, Redmond, um, obviously Bellevue, um, cities that have, say, seven to eight to 10 fire stations you get you get a little bit more economic um, efficiency with that large of an organization. Two or three, you're probably on the other side of that equation. Okay, and then what's as an example, Bellevue? What's made Bellevue successful with their changing city dynamic with high-rise buildings changing the way their fire stations look? Kind of understanding that as well, because you mentioned that our community is changing. And our density is higher in downtown, which may use different assets mm -hmm. um, than an outer area, as an example. So just maybe under, having some information so we can kind of understand that dynamic, mm -hmm. of, because that, that city has gone through a huge transformation very rapidly. So how have they, you know, just kind of understanding that, that dynamic okay. com comes to mind. Um, we'll put that on the list and get back to you on that. Okay. Something comes to mind. Um, and then um, are we, is any part of the touch points that we talked about looking at things through a, a diversity and equity lens? Yes. I think our stakeholder outreach will probably include that lens. I don't know why it wouldn't. Uh, the factual information around RCW options, probably not as much because they're more factual, but our, our stakeholder outreach as well as our service level, yes. Okay, and service service levels and equity across the city, kind of understanding like what it's, what it's really costing service level wise in a downtown core versus. We'll do our best to separate the city. I think that would be more challenging, but we will certainly look at it. Well, I will definitely put a peek into that, absolutely. Um, yeah, because I, I think what comes to mind is the EMS level of service and I where see. that level of sure. service takes place. Um, I, I think I've heard in the past some reports that have said it, it happens in certain areas, certain pockets of our city, and the response times in that area may look different I than see. response times in, in other parts of the city. I see. We can look. I, I understand what you're asking for, certainly. We can, we can look into that. Yeah, and, I, and I, I bring that up because having been part of a couple of the past conversations, it's, it's a, there's a cost element, but there's also... What I've heard the majority of people are concerned with is the level of service. Absolutely. Just flat out the level of service. Um, and I think making sure that we give that security to the community that they're going to continue to maintain that level of service, no matter what direction we go, I think is, is going to be the most important part of that, that, that conversation. Um, let me see. Talk about that. I think I, um, I think I, I covered. Um, I think I covered Thank everything. You. Um, Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate the feedback. Thank you very much. Most importantly, mm -hmm. can we increase the level of service of pancakes? Uh, mm -hmm. That's on my list. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah, number I one. I like space. lighter and fluffier, so we'll see how they do. I'll be flipping them. So. Mm -hmm. No guarantees. Do we have your feedback to continue to move forward? <laughs> I just have one more question, or more of a request. Sure. Um, just thinking about our our local electeds in Fire District 10's Fire Commission, mm -hmm. can we make sure we're just keeping them up to date on what we're doing? And just want to make sure they don't hear it from a side angle and get cut off guard with. Yeah. Um, I've after we briefed 
the Public Safety Committee at the next Commissioner's meeting. I brought them in on the conversation, and they are uh, want to be engaged with us on this. So, perfect. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Good question. Thank you. Do we have a, a nod to move forward? Are we are we okay? I'm going to steal what Ben said and, and say, what did you say? Anxiously interested? Cautiously interested? Nervously. 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 There we go. Yeah. I'm okay continuing to do it, but okay. it's going to have to be a really big no-brainer for me to give our fire department up. All right. Thank you. You got it. All right, council conversations. Oh, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna start. adjourn from executive I'm gonna start. I have exciting stuff for council conversations. Um, so happy Ride Transit Month and Pride Month, everyone. Um, we had a great flag raising. Thank you so much to the city staff who organized everything. Um, I think Becky and Nikki wrote us excellent talking points that we could start with to talk. We had um, great folks from Eastside Pride and PFLAG come out. Um, Cynthia from PFLAG, my, my son James was there, you, you've all met him. Um, he came up and told me good job after I spoke and then he ended up getting himself volunteered to help Cynthia raise the flag at some point. So he was just delighted. Um, and then what was amazing is the city of Kirkland launched in near Marina Park um, an intersex inclusive progress pride flag crosswalk. And they were receiving a lot of just horrible hate messages and threats. Um, to their council and to their city staff. And so their response was to make it bigger. And so Mayor Thompson and I um, went down there and we got to meet up with um, a number of the Kirkland City Council. There were folks from Kenmore, from Redmond, from um, Bellevue, lots of folks. We had um, County Council member Claudia Balducci was there. Um, so we had a really nice event just supporting our, our city, trying to do something good and show people representation. So it was really great to see that sort of regional coalition of people trying to show support. So thank you to Kirkland. And also they gave us free ice cream. So no pressure, Kyle, <laughs> but um, ice cream, please, <laughs> next time. Um, so I just wanted to call that out and um, just say thank you for a great event. Even the you know park staff showed us how to <laughs> raise the flag on the flagpole to make sure that we didn't look super silly when we were doing it. And I think we, I think we did okay. Um, but yeah, awesome. Thanks for letting me jump in. I'm going to try to keep it short. I'm actually not. I'm going to try. Try. Yeah. I'm going to skip one of the, one thing that I include uh, made notes on was um, I appreciated our city manager with showing the um, Bothell Bridge card because that is just pure genius for someone who loves to have a card that I can just pull out and look at things. That thing reads well. I mean, we have our. Summers are just easy to check out and bottle. So I think Nikki was the one who put that together. Props to Nikki. She really did a great job. Um, the only other thing that I want to mention, um, it's far, uh, falling back uh, in history, and it, I almost missed it. But um, we live in a world where it's increasingly narcissistic. And today is uh, D-Day. And I think of my father-in-law, he's since passed on, 17-year-old man on the beaches of Normandy, 17 years old, stacking body parts on, um, on the shores there in Normandy. And um, if you happen to cross paths uh, with anyone in the greatest, from that greatest generation that sacrificially gave, give them a gentle hug and tell them thank you. Um, it's far enough in our own lifetimes. I don't think anyone is here who could say, yeah, I remember that. I mean, I remember 9-11, but um, V-Day is in the history books for me. So I just wanted to put a nod out there of today's the day that a lot of people sacrificed. So. And every part of the planet has where people have had to face horror stories. There's no part of the planet where that, that hasn't happened, but it's worth remembering.
Um, I was trying to find our hero that cleans the 145th, but I've missed them for quite some time. But I, I, I since have something new. Um, I'm excited to announce that Bothell um, Lacrosse 78 team won their first championship. And uh, I would love for us to have a proclamation for them here at the city to honor them. They, um, they beat Eastlake, Skyline, and Mercer Island this year, which is a huge feat all to do in one year. So I'd uh, love to give a shout out to those, uh, to those young um, players. Um, and this month is a special month because they have a they them on their team. So I think it's, uh, it would be an honor to be able to do something for them uh, here at the city. Consider the proclamation request approved. I wanted to sneak back in on proclamations. I love that idea, James. So that that would be great. I hope we can honor them and that I'm not doing it from home that day too. Um, and then we did not do a proclamation for National Police Week. Um, so I wonder if we can get that on the calendar so that we don't miss it in the future. I second that idea. I see a I, thumbs I, up from yeah, Becky. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Are you sure, Jean? Yeah, because I noticed. <laughs> I noticed, you know, on social media, I not I put a nod to it. I think our did our police department. There, I think there was something on it from our social, uh, uh, police department on social media. But we were on break. That's why we missed it. Is that? I mean, we were we weren't meeting in person, were we? Are you saying we were on a break? Because I feel like that's been used before. <laughs> that's what I'm going with. That's that's my excuse, but you're right. We need to we need to remember. No, I, that, I was just sneaking a friend's reference in. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, I I think we could do it before, or like be hopefully before, or maybe after if we have to. But yeah, I it, and I got a thumbs up from Becky, so I feel like that's as good as gold. Well, and another one. Okay, this is going to turn into a proclamation request session. I was it, not warned. <laughs> is we need to rec uh, recognize Japanese internment. I think that's in February, but that's something that comes comes and goes every year, and I feel badly. I just looked at Becky, and she nodded at me. I think she's writing it down right now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, let's go to executive session. Mayor, I will Mayor, also can, note that, can... um, that if we're going to close session and that there is no action anticipated following, so we will adjourn from this meeting. Well said.